If this is not the committee you expected to attend, uh, be alerted now. Uh, today is January 30th. I'm Merv Reapy, I'm chairman of the committee, and I represent District 12, which is Omaha and the city of Ralston. Uh, I'm going to start with self-introductions. We'll have a couple of our committee members arriving here late, and if we can, we'll work in so that they can announce. But in the interest of time, we have a full agenda for today. I know you're all busy and you may have other committees as well. So uh, on my far right, I will start with Senator Blood. Good morning, my name is Senator Carol Blood and I represent District 3, which is the western part of Bellevue and southeastern part of Papillion, Nebraska. Good morning, I will try to be as enthusiastic as Senator Blood is in here. Senator Halloran represent District 33, which is Adams, Kearney and Phelps County. Good morning, Senator Terrell McKinney. I represent District 11, North Omaha. Good morning, I'm Teresa Ibai, represent District 44, which is central and southwest Nebraska. I want to circle back and introduce our uh, log ratchet, who's our legal analyst, and that is Micah Chafee, and also Cole Lumsden here is our, our clerk for today's hearing. Uh, this morning, our pages are Sophia and I believe somebody Chrissy. said John. Uh, there's no John over there. No, it's Christy. Christy. Well, thank you. Thank you both for working. Um, I would start out by asking all of you to silence your phones, beepers, or any other distractions that we may have. Uh, today, before each hearing, all bills will be heard in the order as posted outside of the hearing room and heard in the order that they are posted. Uh, on each of the tables near the doors, you will find green testifier sheets. If you intend to testify today, please fill one out. Uh, legibly print all information handed to Cole when you come to testify. This will help us keep accurate records for the hearing. I'm going to pause a bit and ask Senator Hunt, if she would be willing to introduce herself. Hi, everybody. I'm Senator Megan Hunt, and I represent District 8 in the northern part of Midtown Omaha. Thank you. Um, if you're not testifying at the microphone, but want to go on record as having a positive, uh, as a position or a bill being heard, there are weights, uh, sign-in sheets at each entrance where you may leave your name and other pertinent information. Also, I would note, if you are not testifying but have a pos position letter to submit, the legislature's policy is that all letters for the record must be received by the committee by noon the day prior to the hearing. The senator introducing the proposed legislation this morning will pr uh, first present and will be given the time needed. For purposes of the record, uh, we ask for each presenter to state one's name, spell it, and state who you represent. Senators who serve on this committee are encouraged to ask questions for clarification. That said, the <laughs> presenter and those testifying are not allowed to ask questions of the senator serving on this committee. Senators may have computers, laptops at their disposal regarding hearing, so please understand that they are following the proceeds and are paying attention. In the Business and Labor Committee, we will use the light system to promote maximum engagement of those wishing to express positions as proponents, opponents, and neutral. Each testifier will have five minutes to testify. When you begin, the light will be green. When the light turns yellow, that means you have one minute uh, <coughs> remaining. And when the light turns red, it's time to end your testimony. And I will ask you to wrap up your final thoughts in the interest of others who wish to testify. The five minute rule may change based on the number of people wanting to speak. As chair, I will seek to hear citizens who have traveled from distances uh, to each and every hearing that we will be conducting. We will also acknowledge letters received from all concerned parties and we will do that at the conclusion of testimony. Uh, we have a strict no prop policy in this committee. Should you have handouts you wish to share, please provide 10 copies to ask our pages over here to make copies. Uh, please be aware that any handouts submitted by testifiers will be included as part of the record as exhibits. The pages will then distribute any and all handouts to committee senators. Following all proponent 
opponent and neutral testimony, the bill presenter is offered the opportunity to close with final remarks. I'm almost done. Um, as a committee, we will work diligently to provide a fair and full hearing, and we will make every effort to accommodate special needs. Short of an emergency, this committee will not take action on a bill the day of the hearing. At this hearing, we ask you to be respectful of the process and to one another. With that, we will begin the hearing with LB 469, and we welcome Senator Powell. Oh, there she is, okay. I would also add, if I may, as you said, our plan is to break for a one hour lunch following LB 57. That said, time permitting, we will proceed with the hearing for the one nominee that we have from the Department of Labor, and we will possibly uh, progress through LB 427. It was difficult for us to predict exactly when a lunch break would come uh, because we have no idea exactly how long each hearing will go. With that, I would like to, before Senator Culp starts with 469, I would like to turn to Senator Hansen for self-introduction. Senator Ben Hansen, District 16, Washington, Burt, coming in now part of Stanton County. Thank you. Welcome, Senator Culp. If you would begin with your name and spell it and who you represent. Good morning, Chairman Reapy and members of the committee. My name is Kathleen Kauth, that's K-A-T-H-L-E-E-N-K-A-U-T-H, -E -E State Senator representing LD31, which is the Millard area. And I come before you today to introduce LB 469. LB 469 addresses the collective bargaining units for the state and asks you to consider the request of probation and parole officers to be included in the protective services bargaining unit. There are 12 different types of bargaining units among all state agencies. The units group classifications of employees who are occupationally and functionally related or share a community of interest. Currently, parole officers are in the social services and counseling unit. They would like to be moved to the protective services unit, which they believe is a better fit based on the job duties. It is important that their union representation understands the intricacies of their work in order to effectively represent them. Probation officers are not currently in a service unit because as a member of the judicial branch, they cannot be in a union. This bill is being introduced with probation officers included because there's another bill introduced this session by Senator Wayne, LB 479, which would transfer the Office of Probation Administration to the executive branch. The judicial branch will be speaking in opposition to this bill because at this time, probation officers are under their purview. It is acceptable to hold this bill in committee until LB 479 is addressed and make amendments as needed. Thank you. Any questions? Are there any questions from the committee to the presenter? Seeing none, we will move on with proponents, please. Again, sir, if you would give us your name, spell it. I assume you've been here before. Yes. Okay. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Chairman Reapy. My name's Gary Young. I'm here, uh, G-A-R-Y-Y-O-U-N-G. Uh, I'm here on behalf of Fraternal Order of Police, Lodge 88. Uh, Lodge 88 is the group that represents uh, uh, and is a collective bargaining agent for corrects about 1,500 corrections workers across the state of Nebraska who provide services inside the uh, prison facilities to, to incarcerated persons. Uh, they are also the exclusive bargaining agent for the protective services bargaining group that the parole officers are seeking to join. Um, I've given you a couple of handouts just to help. I, it's kind of, we kind of get into the weeds of the state employee collective bargaining act. And I just want to make sure that we are understood. Uh, if you, if you take a look at the uh, statute, you'll see that the state has organized all of the state employees into 12 bargaining units. And in 1987, when this statute was passed, DAS was charged with taking all of the, all of the job classifications and distributing them as they saw fit. The, the basic uh, organizational principle was that the units would consist of jobs that are occupationally and functionally related. That is, they worked in the same areas. The idea being, if you if you carry out the same sort of work or are involved in the same sorts of workplaces, uh, you're going to have similar bargaining interests, and you're not going to be in conflict. 
And so that's kind of the motivating principle. The second motivating principle is, is where you, who do you want to be represented by? Uh, because people, of course, have preferences. And one of the goals of the Industrial Relations Act is to allow people to be represented by who they want to be represented by. Uh, if you if you take a look at this first handout I've given you, I just want to discuss that first principle, which is where should the groups be located? Where should parole officers and probation officers be? Uh, and uh, you can see on the left there is the place where they currently are. They're currently in a bargaining unit with uh, that's associated mostly with counseling uh, 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 workers. And so you have Medicaid clerks, workers, uh, pharmacists, administrative nurses, uh, recreation specialists, and mental health health therapists as some examples. Uh, if you look over on the protective services bargaining unit, though, you'll see that the the uh, group that the, the types of workers that are in the protective services unit includes correctional officers, correctional case workers, sergeants, uh, security staff in DHHS facilities, and in youth security facilities. Uh, on the one hand, right now, the parole officers are in a bargaining unit that really has very a variety of missions to a variety of different uh, clientele and, and uh, people they're trying to serve. Uh, and uh, if and, and a lot of those things have nothing to do with their work. Uh, in fact, most of them. And, and there's a way in which parole officers are really misplaced uh, currently. Uh, if they are moved to protective services, you can see the relationship that they have uh, to those employees. Uh, they are serving the same people. They have a similar mission, which is to keep the public safe, keep the uh, incarcerated person safe while they're incarcerated, and help with transitioning uh, folks who are leaving incarceration. Uh, they are serving the same people. They know the same people. They have been providing services inside uh, the facilities and uh, parole officers, of course, are, are providing services and helping with people transition outside the facilities. It just makes sense that they would be in the same uh, group. Uh, secondly, and we'll have some testimony on this from other presenters, uh, the parole officers have made it clear for on three years or three years or more now that they want to be moved. And so the second thing we've given you as an exhibit is a petition that was started by the parole officers uh, uh, back in 2021 and persisted uh, through 2022. This includes all, uh, at the time, all of the parole officers uh, that we were aware of. I believe it was 100% participation in the petition. Uh, they have certainly been pr uh, pressing our, us to help them get moved. Uh, so we would like to respond to that. Uh, we feel like it only makes sense with the work that they do, and it also makes sense with the goal of having people in bargaining units represented by their representatives that they prefer. Uh, with that, I'll, I'll answer any questions. Other questions from the board? Yes, sir. Senator. Thank you, Thank you Chair Reby. Um Quick question, what benefit to, to the state does this do if they are transferred to the protective service, service body? Uh, the stated goals of the state are that we are to have people in the same groups that are functionally related. We want people, when we bargain with the state, I bargained for this group with the state on the other side of the table. They've, they want to be dealing with people who have similar interests rather than have divided interests. They want to be talking about the same subject matter and the same topics that are that are functionally important for bargaining. If you have people in the same groups, they're going to be, uh, uh, the, the, funct the bargaining uh, mechanism is going to work a lot more smoothly. How does this benefit the people of Nebraska? Yeah, the, 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 the parole officers, uh, the, one of the stated goals in the statute of the Industrial Relations Act is that we want people to be represented and we want them to be represented by the organizations that they prefer. Uh, that's one of the goals of collective bargaining and this would advance that goal. All right, uh, you didn't answer my question, but thank you. Okay, thank you, Senator. Okay, other questions? I have a couple of questions. So one of them would be is, how does this, I think I heard uh, Senator Wayne has an LB-479 that's 
similar to this bill? Can you help us out with yeah, you yes. this bill versus, or are you going to support his bill as well? Yes, yeah, so we, we are in support of that bill as well. Okay. Uh, Senator Wayne has brought a bill in order to uh, bring uh, pro the probation function under the uh, supervision of the executive branch. Right now it's under the supervision of the judicial branch. Uh, the idea of adding that language to 469 is so that if that takes place, probation officers could also have bargaining representation. Right now, under the judicial branch, uh, they're, 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 they don't have any bargaining rights and no bargaining function. And we would like them to be able to, if, in the event that that bill passes. So you seek to avoid this committee? What's that? You seek to avoid this committee? Never, never. Oh, yes. Okay. Uh, my second question would be is uh, with the addition of these officers, what impact is that? Is that 25% increase or 10%? What increase to the bargaining unit is it? Uh, no, uh, there's, I think there, I believe there's th about 30 or 35 parole officers. And that, do you have a percentage number on that? Uh, that would be a very small percentage. So the, the bargaining unit currently is, has 1,500 members in it. Okay. And so it would be, you know, I don't know. It's quick math, uh, but a very small percentage. Do you then personally become the representative for the entire group? Do, do I personally? Yes. So no, I just am the chief bargain, the chief negotiator for the group that represents them, which is the Fraternal Order of Police. So you're a subgroup. Uh, you're a subgroup within the larger bargaining unit. So uh, no, represent the, the we represent the whole bargaining unit as one. Okay. And so that's corrections workers, officers, sergeants, uh, case workers, and a few other categories of people. And then they would be added to that group. But and they would, you said that's a small portion of the entire bargaining yes. group. Yes. Then who represents the entirety of the bargaining unit? Yeah, the Fraternal Order Police Lodge 88 is the, represents the entire group at once at bargaining. So the group that you're merging into, fundamentally, you're taking over? Uh, I'm confused on this. Yeah, the parole officers, no, uh, it's, it's okay. The parole officers would be moving into that group. Yes. Of 1,500, now the 30 or 35 would be added to that group. And then they would just be one. That group is currently represented by the, the Lodge 88, which I'm here on behalf of. Okay. There's okay. no other group. So involved. you're on behalf of the Lodge, you're not the negotiating agent uh the law so the way the law works is the lodge is the negotiating agent under the statute uh i i when you're directing the questions to me personally i just happen to be the person who negotiates for them okay 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 senator mccann thank you um one more question yeah do you not see a potential i want to say conflict or perception issue with parole officers being associated with the Fraternal Order of Police. Do you not see an issue with that? No, no, I don't. I don't. Uh, I think if you ask them, they would like to be associated with the FOP. Um, so I, I don't have any, uh, any idea what a conflict might be. All right, just pointing it out. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Senator McKinney. Are there other? Uh, questions if not thank you very much thank you senator do we have more proponents if you would sir if you would give us your name spell it mm -hmm. who you represent good morning my name is clayton c-l-a-y-t-o-n Wells, W-E-L-L-S. I'm here today uh, representing myself. I am uh, currently a state employee employed as a specialized parole officer. And I am testifying in, in uh, support of this bill. Yeah, go ahead. Thank you, sir. And the reason I'm testifying is I believe that uh, myself, I believe that we need better representation from our bargaining unit, which we are not currently getting. <clears throat> there's a uh, 
LB 83-1100 that addresses how co-officers are supposed to be compensated. And uh, I began uh, trying to work the process with the union back in uh, August of, I'm sorry, yes, August of uh, 2018. Uh, to try and get uh, wages increased mm -hmm. in the 20. Would you be able to speak up just a little bit? I think we have some people that aren't able to hear. Is that better, Senator? I think that's better. Okay. Okay. I, I began the process back in August of 2018 to try and assist uh, my fellow parole officers in trying to get compensated per the state law. And when the 2019 2021 contract came out, we received the same wage as the prior contract and we were never offered really a reason as to why nothing occurred. And for approximately three and a half years in trying to uh, ask our union representation as to when we were going to uh, see some sort of wage increase. I'm sorry, to, to, I don't mean to haggle it, but I, if you can project a little bit louder, I don't think that okay. Even this, it, it's a bit difficult whether it's in the mic or not. I'm sorry. I just, Thank you. I, I, uh, hear your I hope I hope that, that when I do project, that it doesn't come across as that I am upset or anything. It's just that when I project my voice, it does get very loud. We can okay. tolerate that. Okay. <laughs> so, yeah, that, I uh, I have some prior experience. As senators, we've been yelled at before, so go ahead. <laughs> I'm not going to do that today. Oh, okay. Senator. I'm not going to do that today. Uh, you know, when, when we were, when we were go going through this process of three and a half years of trying to get some additional wages, we were met with comments that unless more parole officers became dues paying members, we weren't going to get any action on it. Uh, one particular comment that was extremely crushing to me was when a union employee told me that Justin doesn't agree with the state law. Justin refers, refers to Justin Hubley, the executive director of NAEP, our current bargaining unit. Additionally, uh, you know, I feel that, you know, we would, we would uh, benefit from being with the protective services bargaining unit as we do align pretty good with the corrections end of it. And the reason I say that is because I started off uh, working for the state in 1999 at the Nebraska State Penitentiary at that time. And again, you know, the, the mission is to, you know, to try to keep people safe, you know, inside the institutions. We were, uh, you know, working with those, with those clients, working with those people that were incarcerated, uh, you know, trying to hold them accountable, trying to work with them, trying to prepare them for reentry. And now as a parole officer, you know, my job when they come out is to try and assist them into the transition of being back into the community again, to uh, try and give them some services, to try and work with them, hold them accountable as needable, as needed, and then as well as, uh, you know, help them feel safe out here in the community. So, you know, I think that we, we, we would actually pretty closely align with those other correction staff because it, when, when we talk about somebody that goes into prison, it is kind of from beginning to end, from when they go through incarceration and they finally get to supervision. Uh, a couple of last things is that uh, as a result, I have one minute. Thank you. As a result of my testimony at last year's uh, Judiciary Committee, the uh, union decided that uh, when I testified at that time and agreed that we needed a different bargaining unit, they took that information, they took that testimony, and they ultimately uh, expelled me from the union. I was a dues-paying member for over 20 years, and they took that information that I uh, thought that we needed a different bargaining unit and expelled me from the union. Finally, because of their lack of inaction with trying to get us more money, not only did it impact my, my take home pay, it impacted the amount of money that I am able to put into my retirement fund per state law. It impacted the amount of money that the state matches. And finally, 
it impacted my social security wage, which takes me into my retirement. Thank you, sir. The red light's up. Do you have any final brief comments that you wish to make? That would be that, that, that and finally, because we are not even being compensated in an appropriate manner, my social security wage, for which I'm partly going to re, uh, rely upon in some years coming, was greatly impacted. Okay, great. Thank you very much. We appreciate your coming forward and testifying today. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Unless you have questions, let's see. Apparently none. So thank you very much again. Proponents, uh, and if you are testifying this morning, if you would, uh, when the others are speaking, come to the front so we can move along here. Okay, that was not a proponent. Russ Schultz, I'm a proponent. Okay, would you just give your green sheet to Cole over here? Her page. Hopefully I'm not as quiet as Clayton. <coughs> okay, well, okay. Sorry. We have a lot of people here. We want them to hear that. Yeah, no, not a problem at all. I work with Clayton on a regular basis. He's if never you would that give quiet. us your... Uh... My name is Russell, R-U-S-S-E-L-L, -S -S -E -L -L, last name Schultz, S-C-H-U-L-T-Z-E. Um, I'm here as a, in a, uh, support of this bill. Um, you had some great questions, Senator McKinney. Um, things that we as parole officers worry about daily. Um, how is this going to help out Nebraskans? Our job is one of the primary parts of our, my job as a parole officer is community safety. And in order to do that, uh, effectively, we need to make sure that these probation and parole jobs are fully staffed. Um, we just in the two and a half years I've been with parole, uh, got fully staffed and I work out of Omaha um, and just just recently have a fully staffed office um, and some of those are moving on um, we're open to doing different things and they're moving to different jobs and parole and I think um, how how is this going to help out Nebraskans I think that's how if we are able to retain more of our parole and probation officers um, I started out in probation um, and that's a six-month training so you get hired on, you're not effectively able to do your job for six months. That's huge when you're dealing with the clientele that we deal with. And understand when I say that, the clientele that we deal with are people that when I go out to meet with my clients, I have to put on a bulletproof vest so that I don't get shot. Does that happen very often? No. Have I been punched and, and kicked? Yeah, but that's part of this job and that's part of helping these clients be successful, not just on parole, but in life. And that's why we do this job is to help out people. The second part of it is um, we as parole officers, and even when I was in probation, we talked about it, we wanted to be part of the FOP because not so that we could be seen as law enforcement officers, not so we could be seen in, as equal to cops, because that happens already. We, I've already been called an effing pig, excuse my language, um, going into a house, going into an apartment. So that's already happening. The stigma that may or may not increase because we've changed collective bargaining units, I think is minimal at best. Um, because we're already viewed that way. My history with unions, I've been a master steward of a union for an underground coal mine started out as a surface coal mine in that in that part of my life um we separated out the surface and underground coal miners because there's different different dangers different intricacies in the types of work and that needs to happen here do i do a lot of counseling in my job heck yeah I deal with clients that have been in prison for two, three, five, six, 13 years, 20 years. So yeah, I do a lot of counseling. I do a lot of teaching. I do a lot of training. You know how many bank accounts I've helped people set up? A lot. So should I be lumped in with teachers? No, because that's not me. 
my job is to help clients coming out of prison be successful, develop those tools that a lot of us who grew up in different types of different backgrounds already were taught, right? It's short, you have one minute. I have one minute. Thank you, Senator. Um, so for us moving into another bargaining unit that already understands the trials and tribulations we deal with, that's just common sense. That just makes sense, right? You wouldn't want to put horse handlers in with people that run front end loaders, right? Because they do different things. Us in with counselors, us in with um, secretaries and other people that don't do our jobs, even remotely do our jobs, and secretaries may not be right. Don't quote me on that. But um, moving us in with people that deal with the same clientele, it just makes sense. That's where we need to be. That's where we should have been. And probation is is a similar offshoot. They're the, the redheaded step cousins of us, right? So I say that because I work probation, so I love them too. Um, but we need to be in the FOP. So any Thank questions? You. Thank you, Mr. Schultz. Any other questions from the committee? Did I answer your question, sir? I hope so. I tried to. Um, yeah, uh, you did sort of. I just personally just the close relationship with parole and police just makes me feel uncomfortable, honestly. Right. I, I get it. So get it. that's just my stance. Yeah. Thank you. You bet. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Oh, you other bet. additional proponents? Any others speaking in favor? If not, do we have proponents? If you will, sir, your name, spell it, please, and uh, proceed forward. Good morning, Chairperson Reapy and members of the Business and Labor Committee. My name is Gene Cotter, G-E-N-E-C-O-T-T-E-R, and I'm a Deputy Administrator with the Administrative Office of the Courts and Probation. And as Senator Cal mentioned earlier, I am here to testify in opposition to LB 469. As has already been mentioned this morning a little bit, LB 469 would add probation officers to the collective bargaining unit of protective service employees under Nebraska revised statute 81 1371F of the Employee State Collective Bargaining Act. If adopted, probation officers would also be subject to the Industrial Real Relations Act. Uh, and in Nebraska, probation officers are employees of the Nebraska Supreme Court. The unionization of probation officers would subject the Supreme Court to the jurisdiction of an administrative uh, agency and the Commission of Industrial Relations. Such oversight would likely be found to violate the separation of powers clause of the Constitution, as well as the principle of Supreme Court supremacy. The Attorney, Attorney General's Office, uh, in an opinion which I've attached for you, in 2008 at the request of Senator John Hilgert, uh, opined similarly to that. So in closing, uh, we believe inclusion of probation officers in this bill violates Nebraska's constitutional protections against the separation of powers. And as such, we recommend or request that probation officers be stricken from the bill. I appreciate your time. If you have any questions, I'm more than happy to answer them. Thank you very much. Thank you for being here. Other questions from the committee? Thank you. Is it, the, thank you. Is it the opinion of the court that parole would function a lot better under your jurisdiction or another? Senator McKinney, I don't know that I'm equipped to answer the question about whether parole would function better under our supervision. I can certainly speak to the way we function uh, as members of the court, uh, but I don't know that I'm equipped to answer that question. All right. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Senator. Other questions? Uh, I do have a question. My question is this is, how does this relate to the Commission for Industrial Relations? I mean, don't they have some role in this play? Uh, yeah, Senator Reapy, I believe they do. And I think that that's what, if, if parole, I'm sorry, if probation officers were to move under that collective bargaining unit, then they would be subject to that board. Well, if, as Supreme Court employees, um, the Supreme Court supremacy, the, the rulings of an executive branch agency as it pertained to judicial branch employees, there would be a potential separation of powers conflict there, um, other potential contradictions to the Constitution and, and other case law. So it becomes 
problematic with the uh, commission. Correct. Okay. Are there other questions, concerns? Okay. Thank you very much for being here this morning. We appreciate it very much. Additional opponents? Good morning, sir. You'll give us your name, spell it. Good welcome. morning, Senator Reapy, members of the committee. My name is Justin Hubley, J U S T I N H U B L Y. I'm the executive director of the Nebraska Association of Public Employees, AFSCME Local 61. We represent over 8,000 state employees in eight bargaining units that work at uh, over 40 different code and non-code agencies in all 93 counties in Nebraska. Our union's against this bill, and, and I want to be clear why. It's not self-serving because we currently represent the parole officers, but we have concerns about the precedence that it sets. You heard testimony previously from the Fraternal Order of Police that you know, they want the employees to choose their union and the employees should get to choose their union, but this legislation actually makes the government decide who their union is by placing them into the protective services bargaining unit. So what should happen and what's the recourse available? When employees disagree with the bargaining unit they're in, there's already a process and statute and the rules of the commission on industrial relation. They should file a unit clarification petition an evidentiary hearing would be conducted that's subject to judicial review. Um, to my knowledge, the FOP or the employees have not filed such a petition. That would be one. Number two, if they're disappointed with their union, they could always attempt to decertify that union and try another. I'm unaware of an effort to do that either. Here's a solution for you that would actually solve this problem. If you really feel that there should be a new bargaining unit, create a new bargaining unit. Don't just put parole officers and probation officers into one that they may or may not fit in. Uh, instead, you could create a 13th bargaining unit, call it what you want, the parole and probation bargaining unit. That would trigger an election. The commission would have an election for the employees to vote on who, who their union should be. So that's really, it's a procedural issue. I'm concerned we represent over 490 job classifications and that every session somebody's gonna be back in here asking the government to put them in a bargaining unit so that they can have this union or that. And that's not how this process should work. Finally, I passed out just one, one sheet of email. It's an email from a FOIA request that we made. And it's concerning to me because this is the FOP talking with management at the Board of Parole. And they've said that Ms. Cotton, the Board of Parole Chairwoman, Director Misick, the Director of Supervision, and the Assistant Director, Ken Quinn, all support uh, the Fraternal Order of Police representing their employees. Folks, I'm here to tell you that when management and a union collude, the employees lose. The union is the voice of the employees in the situation. The management has plenty of representatives at their disposal. So with that, I'd ask that you definitely postpone this bill. I think there's better ways to handle this, primarily through the current law. Uh, but if you do feel a need to do this, I'd ask you to amend this bill so that it creates a new bargaining unit to trigger an election under state law. Thank you. We have to answer any questions. Other questions? Again, I would ask the question, if I may, on how does this relate to your opinion to LB 479, Senator Wayne's bill? Yeah, I, I have concerns about the constitutionality about it, but um, assuming it is constitutional, we actually would support probation officers having the right to collectively bargain for their wages and benefits and working conditions. And if that were the case, though, again, instead of just with the way this bill works, instead of placing them into a bargaining unit before they even have collective bargaining rights, we would create a new bargaining unit for them and trigger an election back like it happened in 1987. Granted, I was in kindergarten back then, but that they tell me it happened. Oh, stop bragging. <laughs> okay. If there are no further questions, thank you very thank much you. for your testimony. Opponents, additional opponents. Here we go. Okay. Give us your name. And then Good morning. Uh, and who you represent, please. My name is uh, Susan Martin, S U S A N M A R T I N. Uh, testifying on behalf of the Nebraska State AFL-CIO in opposition to LB 469. Currently, as you've heard, parole officers fall under the C unit, social services and counseling and the state employees collective bargaining agreement, whose bargaining agent is NAPE AFSCME Local 61. This bill is making a change to place this classification of employee in the protective services unit in the state employees collective bargaining agreement which is bargained by the Fraternal Order of Police. By agreeing to this legislation, it moves the parole officers from under the collective bargaining agent, NAPE AFSCME, to the Fraternal Order of Police. Currently, there are rules under the Commission of Industrial Relations for unit clarification. Allowing this change in legislation as presented in this bill circumvents that process our biggest concern with this is it sets precedent for future classification of state employees moving from one bargaining agent to another 
without going through the proper procedures. There's already a clear path to do this under Rule 12 and the rules of the Commission of Industrial Relations. We ask that you oppose this bill and indefinitely postpone it. Thank you. Thank you very much for being here. Are there questions from the committee? Um, hearing none, okay, thank, thank you. you very much. Additional opponents? Uh, those in opposition? Seeing none, are there any who wish to testify in a neutral position? Okay, seeing none. Uh, Cole, do we have any letters to, regarding opposing or proposing? You have those separate. Well, I am. I don't know what the count is on them, though. We do have a number of opponent and proponents. Uh, I don't know what that count is right off. Is it on this sheet? It's one opponent. I didn't see a count on there. Is there a count? Right. Okay. Letters, it appears there are zero proponents, one opponent, and zero neutral, so we're in good shape. Okay. Uh, Senator Galt, you're welcome to close your hand. She's waving closing, so with that, I would declare a fair and a comprehensive uh, hearing, and we're going to move on to LB 2567. Senator Brewer. Senator Brewer, thank you very much. You know the rules, so I will just turn it over to you. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Chairman Rapey, and uh, good afternoon, fellow senators of the Business Labor Committee. I am Senator Tom Brewer, for the record that is T-O-M-B-R-E-W-E-R, -E -E and I represent 11 counties of the 43rd Legislative District of Western Nebraska. I am here today to introduce LB 267. Essentially, the components of this bill, uh, this is the second uh, time around. Last year, we tried to get this bill through and literally ran out of time in a short session with all the business that we had. This bill was brought to me by Public Power. After listening to them, I uh, was convinced that this is something that needed addressed, and that is how LB 267 came about. Critical infrastructure employees work to protect our communities while ensuring continuity of function critical to the public health and safety, as well as economic and national security. Critical infrastructure employees need to be afforded every privilege and priority during a declared emergency. While state legislatures play a key role in emergency management, that role is primarily exercised long Stress that again, long before any emergency is declared. Often by passing laws that shape how the executive branch and state agencies are to respond to emergencies, to enable a coordinated response and recover from an emergency when it strikes. That being said, Nebraska needs to update the way that we manage declared emergencies. This is what LB 267 aims to do. It is a step to protect critical infrastructure utility workers. Again, this is for protecting critical infrastructure utility workers. Utilities not only power and heat our homes, businesses, they fuel our vehicles, they power hospitals and public safety facilities. Due to this disruptions to key critical utility infrastructure and workers have the potential to threaten the health, safety, and well-being of Nebraskans. Now, stop for a moment and think back two years ago. That is when the ice storm and the cold hit and we had a collapse of the electrical system. Worse south of here, Nebraska Public Power did a good job of managing it. We still had rolling blackouts and issues. These critical energy workers support and preserve the infrastructure and operational centers critical to maintaining the backbone of our society by prioritizing their health and safety for vaccine distribution alongside other frontline workers. We assure continuous distribution of energy and utilities to Nebraskans 
both rural and urban. You have to understand that this is for a limited pool of highly skilled workers whose expertise has been deemed necessary to the uh, continued reliability of operations for these utilities. If one member of a team is compromised, the whole team could potentially be compromised. Given the specialty of knowledge required to perform these functions, it is critical that we preserve these. The federal government has weighed in as well. In March of 2020, and updated again in 2021, the U.S. Department of Homeland Security issued guidance on essential critical infrastructure workers to be prioritized. The Secretary of Energy advocated for critical infrastructure workers, as did the U.S. Federal uh, Energy Regulatory Commission. Nebraska needs to address these sooner rather than later. I will be followed by uh, OPPD that can go into more of the specific details that has generated this bill. But I just want to stress to you that all we're asking to do is to have a law to protect them. And the reason that we need a law is because if it's a policy, governor change and policy change, if this is critical to the businesses and the, 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 the people of Nebraska, then that's why we need this law. With that, I am open for questions. Thank you, Senator. Are there other questions from the committee? And I will, oh, yes. I have just one, just to clarify. So you're saying that the policy doesn't protect them, but legislation would? Well, I think what you'll probably hear today is they'll come back with a, well, we've changed the policy, so it's not an issue. What I'm saying is we need to make it so it's in black and white and it guarantees that that critical worker is protected. And again, OPPD will go into the details what caused this to happen. But I think once you hear that, it will make sense that this isn't something that we should trust to the system. This needs to be something that's that's fixed and that we have a set policy Thank you. in the law. Are there other questions? I have a couple of questions, Senator. Uh, does this preempt another group in terms of the ranking in terms of who's the first, second, third priority? No, I think what this does more is, let's say, for example, you have um, a, a system that has certain people prioritized for, say, testing in the case of COVID-19. And your critical infrastructure worker, in this case, electrical, they show up and they're not given tests because they're not on this critical list. And consequently, they're not able to go and change shift with those at the plant. Say the plant is, is in a lockdown because of COVID. They can't get new folks in because they can't get them tested. They can't get them tested because there is no set policy that that is the law that they must be tested. And we're just trying to make that so that it, it's a system where they are part of those critical workers, whether it be fire, whether it be rescue, whether it be uh, police, they need to be in a, in a equal status to them so that there is no question. They are tested and they are, are given the vaccine or whatever the scenario is and, and, and they're in that special category. Who makes up the uh, list of who's on that priority? Yeah, this would do it by statute. Well, I mean, that's going to be through the executive branch where that's determined. Okay. Was there ever an issue of available resources? Uh, the critical access I remember when the pandemic first came through. I think if you ask that question to uh, OPPD, they can give you a very detailed answer on that. Okay. Thank you very much. Are there the yes, Senator Hunt. Thank you, Chairman Reapy. Thank you, Senator Brewer. Maybe this is kind of a dumb question, and maybe someone after you can answer it, but um, I was reading this bill last week, and this part on page two, line seven, I'll just read it to you. You don't have to look. It says um, critical infrastructure utility worker means an essential critical infrastructure worker identified in the guidance on the essential critical infrastructure workforce version 4.1 as released by the United States Department of Homeland Security. So I go look at that document and honestly, they identify like every worker, like every worker, like grocery store worker, pharmacy staff, um, 
donors of blood and the workers of the organizations that operate and manage those activities, workers in retail facilities, like it's not just um, utility workers. So am I misreading the bill or does it include all of these workers or um, I heard you just say that that would be kind of for the executive branch to determine, but I don't see that outlined in this bill. That well, I get it. Now, uh, what you're reading, and that identifies as the critical infrastructure workers. Mm-hmm. Well, not I tell to you alert what. you to something I love that you might not love, but well, like no, I, and I did not realize it was that broad. Uh, so I tell you what, between um, Maybe I should now and close, let me let me check on that, and that might be another question that uh, OPPD will have a better. Uh, I love portion. Senator Brewer bringing a huge workers' rights bill, so I. Uh, again, maybe I'm misunderstanding the scope of the bill, but um, yeah, maybe someone after you can speak to that too. All right, we'll we'll uh, we'll get you an answer with close. How does that sound? Okay. No rush at all. Okay. We've got time. A little bit of a rush. <laughs> Thank you, Senator Hunt. Are there other questions from the committee members? Hearing none. Thank you. Thank you. We sound like you're going to be around for closing. I'll be around for closing. Okay. Thank you, sir. Are there proponents that uh, this is a representative I know from OPPD, so. If you will kind of answer <laughs> your name and spell it, and then we know that you represent OPPD, so then you're welcome to go forward. All right, thank you. Uh, good morning, Chairman Reapy and members of the committee. My name is Seth Boyles. S-E-T-H-V is in Victor, O-Y-L-E-S. And I'm a registered lobbyist for the Omaha Public Power District and I'm testifying on behalf of OPPD. I'm also testifying on behalf of the Nebraska Power Association. The NPA is a voluntary association representing all of Nebraska's approximately 165 consumer and public power systems. So it's all of our utilities. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to testify in front of the Business and Labor Committee on this important legislation. I want to ex- express OPPD's and MPA's support of LB 267, a bill to adopt the Critical Infrastructure Utility Worker Protection Act. I also want to thank Senator Brewer for introducing this common sense bill. And while I'm at it, I would also like to thank Senators Flood, if she was here, Halloran, Hunt, and Hansen for supporting this bill at a committee last year and also getting a Business and Labor Committee uh, priority out of it as well. Um, OPD workers conduct a range of operations and services that are essential to continued critical infrastructure viability, including staffing operation centers, maintaining repairing critical infrastructure, um, working construction, performing operational functions, amongst others. Critical infrastructure employees need to be afforded every prioritization that we can during a declared emergency, and it's only during declared emergencies. I want to emphasize that point. It's only on declared emergencies. The need for this bill became apparent during COVID, and I'm going to tell the story of how we came about. So once COVID hit, we started planning, you know, to figure out what we were going to do. And after a while, we figured we're going to sequester our employees at our power plants. Seven to 10 days on, seven to 10 days off, two rolling crews of what we were going to do. So we sent them down to get tested. The first crew we sent down to get tested, they were rejected for just getting tested for COVID. And as Senator Brewer said, if you're in a room, control room is a lot smaller than this room, you're all together. So if one person has it, everyone has it. And if that happens, we may have to shut down that power plant. So after, once we found that out, we can contacted the governor's office and after some back and forth, after a while, um, the governor chief staff called us and said, hey, if you guys need to get tested, let us know and we'll find a place for you to get tested. So at the local level, they said we couldn't get tested. And then the governor's office was going to come down and find a place for us to get tested. That's an important fact. And it was great. You know, we really appreciated that was happening. But now going forward, we want to make sure we were going to take care of that. You know, when the governor's, when Governor Ricketts' um, critical infrastructure, or critical worker program came out, it was very lucky that OPPD had a meeting with him two days after. Because when that came out, utility workers were not included in that list of employees, of workers that could get testing or anything like that. We mentioned it to him and he was like, yeah, that was, that was a mistake, got us in there. So it was very grateful that all that stuff happened. But again, going forward, we need to make sure that we're gonna be included um, on anything going forward. And we also understand that not all declared emergencies are the same. It may involve different areas and individuals, different circumstances and challenges. 
But the one thing is the same in all of these emergencies. Addressing any emergency is exponentially more difficult without utilities. We just want to make sure our workers can continue to do their job safely so that other first responders can do their job too. We want to make sure that our customer owners, businesses, and all industries in Nebraska have reliable utilities to deal with the emergency they are experiencing. And Senator Hunt uh, and others, um, we've also heard concerns about with including utility workers with the first responders. In no way does this hinder police, health, fire, EMS, or any of them from the prioritization of per personal protective equipment, vaccines, or other safety measures first. Um, I'll give you an example of that. So after the governor's um, policy came out, they were starting to release vaccines for some. A lot of times you have to take them out of refrigeration. If you don't use them at the end of the day, they expire. So they would call fire. They would call EMS. They would call police. And there'd be like 5, 10, 10, 5. And they'd still have about 70 or so that weren't going to get used. So they'd call utilities. And we'd say, thank you. And they'd say, we'll take them all. And we would send our utilities there after everyone else had it. It's only after. So um, that's what this this bill is a safety measure that will allow critical employees continue to perform their job duties that appropriately balance public safety and health and safety of the workforce, continue delivery of essential services and functions. And we hope and pray we never have to use it. So with that, thank you for your consideration of my testimony and I will answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Senator Hunt, please. Thank you, Chairman Rippey. Is there reason to believe that in the event of an emergency or a pandemic or a civil disaster that a governor wouldn't do this without this law being passed? We're not sure, but we would like to have the assurances that it would, that we wouldn't have to. Because even during COVID, we, we tried to get our guys tested and to go to the power plants. We didn't, we had to call the governor. And realistically, when it comes to emergencies, time is of the essence. And this took us a good month or so to find out that we could even get our, some of our people tested after we got denied. I wonder if in a situation with limited resources, and I'm not saying how I think things should be, I'm saying after living through COVID and seeing how the government handled it, I wonder if in a pandemic or an emergency or civil or whatever, with these limited resources of, we only have this much emergency equipment, we only have this much vaccine, we only have this much thing everybody is fighting for, toilet paper, just kidding, but you know how it was. Okay. Um, in practice, how can this be enforceable if, you know, you may not have an answer, but, um, because I would think that a governor could always just say, we, we are doing our best and it's hard to like have accountability and, um, to prove that like utility workers or any of the number of employees on this list of essential critical infrastructure workers from the Department of Homeland and Security. I mean, this list would include, you know, many types of workers. And if all of them need priority, mm -hmm. that's exactly the situation we were in in 2020. Everybody needed priority. There was vast debate over, you know, food service workers, child care providers, teachers, nurses, doctors, government employees like who gets priority and i don't understand how passing this law would change that question because the the swath of essential workers is so vast but i agree with you and that thank you for the question and it, i'll try to answer part of it and i'll also get to your question about sure. the list of people there when it comes down to these things we may not need it and that's the issue that's going to pop up if we don't need it we're not going to go down there because we have other things that we can do. And that's why we'll never jump ahead of fire, EMS, anyone like the, the first responders. Uh, like on this last one with COVID, it was more about getting tested at first, and then later on with the vaccines that the governor actually helped us with at those parts. But again, as Senator Brewer said, policies change as the governors go, and certain times that happens. This just gives us assurances that if anything like this happens again, that we are able to get our folks in there, that just the critical ones. And on your list there too, that's why we, we, we put it on utility workers. And I know this is a big list of everyone. I, I have it here. Um, it's only for the utility folks that we were planning to have this on. If we need to tighten that up a little bit, we will absolutely do that. Because there's someone here like, uh, let me just find, I'll just open that up randomly. So the energy ones, those are on there, but like, for transportation, we don't think there's any communications and technology. There's a lot of, of infrastructure folks here, but it's not essentially the utilities. So if we need to, yeah. we need to tighten it up for 
for utilities, we can absolutely do that. I think if we tightened it up, we'd have a fight. So, you know, the you bill want to keep is it tricky. Open, okay. Yeah. Well, that's the thing. I mean, we, when it comes down to during any of these emergencies, not everyone's going to go down there and say, hey, police officer, firefighter, EMS worker, get out of the way. My person at the call center needs this first. We're not going to do that. And I don't think anyone in there, we would reasonably ever think that could happen. Like I said, how we would have used this before is just like, hey, we're sending 10 people down to get tested now for COVID. This is the reason why. Once they get tested, they'd be done. Then we'd send down the other crew to get tested so that we just have those ones there. And that's it. Because no matter what happens, any kind of emergency, Senator Brewer talked about the windstorm, the winter storm, URA, COVID. Our, my, my employees were out there no matter what was happening anyway, putting themselves at risk. Mm -hmm. This just gives us a little bit of assurance on the bottom side that make sure that we can keep all of our employees safe, but make sure we can still do our, fun our functions as well. And in order to do these things too, once we keep ourselves safe, it's getting our, our employees back home safe and keeping our families safe yeah. as well. I get all that completely, but do you take my point that in an emergency with limited resources, mm -hmm. a governor will always say, I'm doing my best to get him to who needs him. And yeah. there's nothing this law can do to seemingly to me, force them to act differently. But maybe in a hundred years when we have the next pandemic, they use this yeah. law for that. Well, that's why we, we hope we never have to. And we, we don't want to yeah. try to enforce it either. Our, all it is for us is another tool to say, okay, we need to get tested or we need this or that. If it's, you know, with PPEs, I know, um, someone had a question on about equipment that was there. At one point, um, hand sanitizer mm -hmm. was in short supply. So we ended up, actually utilities actually helped, NREA and others helped get get hand sanitizer to all of their communities as well. So, I mean, we play a role in all these things. And it's of not- Of course, and of course we love utilities, but there are representatives or for hundreds of other groups or hundreds of other groups that don't have representatives that could yeah. come up here and say the same thing. And we all would agree are just as deserving. So oh, and the would, question isn't deserve. Um, yeah. And I would, I would agree with that too. So thank you. Appreciate okay. it. Sandra, did you have any more comments? Did you want no, to say No, if I did, I'd tell you. Well, good. Thank you. That's what we want. <laughs> thank you. Other comments? I guess my one question and a little response, you said, well, we would be in a panic situation, we would be courteous. That doesn't always play out that way when it comes, push comes to shove. And that going a little bit of where Senator Hunt is coming from is, my question always is, who is first among equals? And so, you know, unless you have that very clear and says, you know, being a healthcare kind of background guy, I would say the healthcare workers are probably at the top of the chain. They're gonna get the first wave but that would be arguable. Are there other? Well, I, I can answer. So we agree with that completely. Do you have an answer for that? Yeah, well, we agree with that completely. We would never, our utility workers would never go down and, and jump ahead of anybody else on any of that stuff. And we, we've said that from the beginning. Fire, healthcare, EMS, police, whoever it is. Yeah. We, do, we go after them. Well, I don't think that would be in the legislation, but I think it has to be a policy someplace mm -hmm. that says who's first and who's second and kind of. And set this out in advance. Are and there I think other that's for the locals the committee? too. Hearing none, so right. thank you for thank being you. with us. Are there other proponents, if you will? Okay. If you're wishing to testify, please come forward and get in the front line so we can move along. Thank you. Good morning, Chairman Reefy and members of the committee. My name is Jill Becker, spelled J-I-L-L-B-E-C-K-E-R, and we I appear before you today in support of this legislation. And really, it's just to make a an ask for a technical change. Um, you were just talking with the previous testifier about the definitions, and on page two, line 22, I would ask that the committee clarify that we're referring to natural gas. The definition earlier reference in the federal law includes natural gas. And so it's really just a, a technical correction to make sure that we're talking about the utilities in the same definitional way. With that, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Okay, thank you for being here. Other questions from the committee? Please wait here until we okay. see. Apparently not, so okay, thank, thank you. you very much. Additional proponents.
Good morning again, Chair Reby and members of the Business and Labor Committee. My name is Susan Martin, S-U-S-A-N-M-A-R-T-I-N, testifying on behalf of the Nebraska State AFL-CIO in support of LB 267. Nebraska has been through a lot over the past couple years dealing with natural disasters such as flooding and the COVID-19 health crisis. We recognize the risk to our health care providers and our first responders, as well as essential workers such as grocery store workers and employees in the meat and food processing industry. But there's also other heroes of natural disasters. These are the men and women working in our utility industry. These are critical employees to our infrastructure and put their lives on the line to continuously help the consumer weather the emergencies that we face. During the pandemic and natural disasters such as the flooding four years ago, these heroes are somehow forgotten. These are critical jobs that must go on during a health crisis or a natural disaster. They keep our water clean and flowing, our lights and our laptops on. Many shelter in place to keep our infrastructure running and many have the contingency plans to make sure that there are no disruption in utilities. It just makes sense to further solidify the need to protect these workers so that they have the necessary protections during any civil defense emergency disaster or health crisis. We think this is a good bill and would ask for your support in passing out a committee for full, for, for full floor debate. We thank Senator Brewer for recognizing these workers who are such a critical part of our infrastructure. Thank you for being here. Are the questions from the committee? Seeing none, uh, thank you very much. Additional proponents? Those speaking in favor? Seeing none, are there any opponents? Thank you, General. Thanks for your service. Thank you, Senator. Uh, good morning, Chairman Rippey and members of the Business and Labor Committee. Committee. I am Major General Daryl Bohack, D-A-R-Y-L-B-O-H-A-C, and I serve as both the Adjutant General of the Nebraska Military Department and Director of Nebraska Emergency Management Agency. I'm here today to testify in opposition of LB-267. I view LB-267 as a very clear form of state government supplanting local government's emergency response capabilities and responsibilities with a state mandate. During my nine, nearly 10 years of in this position, I've seen the value of local governments having a level of autonomy when it comes to addressing the unique needs of their communities during times of disaster response. LB-267 is currently remit, written limits local government entities from appropriately responding to their varying and specific needs by inserting a broad definition of who is prioritized and what can be administered during crises. One of my concerns with LB 267 is the adoption of the definition provided in the Guidance on Essential Critical Infrastructure Workforce version 4.1 published by the United States um, Homeland Security, uh, Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency. It is true that I introduced this reference when I testified in opposition to this bill two years ago, but that was to make the point that it would be difficult to be as inclusive as the cybersecurity and infrastructure security agency definition and equally problematic to defend only including certain categories of critical infrastructure workers as originally proposed in 2021. Moreover, following my testimony in 2021, we reached out to Senator Brewer and reached an agreement to add Appendix D or Annex D framework for the inclusion of critical infrastructure workers in disaster response to the governor's emergency fund guidelines for public officials. This change was published on July 7, 2022. And the Nebraska Emergency Management Agency staff briefed the following groups, League of Municip uh, Nebraska Municipalities, Nebraska Association of County Officials, Nebraska Association of Emergency Managers, Nebraska Rural Electric Association, and the major utilities. Moreover, in recognition of the critical role our public utilities play in the lives of Nebraska citizens and the impact that they have on our economy, we also recommended, and Governor Ricketts adopted, a change to the policy regarding public utilities receiving assistance from the Governor's Emergency Fund. 
The governor's guide has been amended to include public power districts for assistance when damage is sustained as a result of a natural disaster or other qualifying event are used to qualify for federal assistance through FEMA's public assistance program. Furthermore, the belief of limited state intervention during emergencies is outlined in Executive Order 0502, written by former Governor Heineman, where it instructs Nebraska to be in compliance with the National Incident Management System. A fundamental principle of NIMS is that all incidents are locally executed and may be facilitated by the state. Even when a presidential disaster declaration occurs, the Federal Emergency Management Agency mantra has been federally resourced, state facilitated, locally executed. This has been the standard that has guided Nebraska's emergency and disaster response. An additional current concern that must be raised is the fiscal impact LB267 could have on the state of Nebraska. Due to the ever-changing nature of emergency response, there is an inconsistent and indeterminable fiscal impact if LB267 were adopted. As outlined, the bill, the state of Nebraska, would assume the cost associated with imposing <laughs> regulations and requirements upon local entities to include the provision of personal protective equipment to not only public sector entities, but also private sector businesses as well. Moore, you have one minute left. Thank you, Senator. I, in closing, I am in opposition to LB267, and it is the, as its intent to supplant local government control and execution of their emergency response processes in a manner that is inconsistent with the fundamental principles of the national uh, incident management system. This is a system which provides a consistent nationwide approach for federal, state, local, and tribal governments to work together more effectively and efficiently to prevent, prepare for, respond to, and recover from domestic incidents regardless of size, cause, or complexity. I am available to answer any questions you might have. Well, we appreciate your efforts in this document. Are there questions from the committee? Senator Howell? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, uh, General, for being here. I I'm trying to wrap my arms around what kind of disaster, uh, an example of what kind of disaster that might take place, and we've had our share of them in Nebraska, but what kind of disaster might take place that wouldn't be exponentially more severe if there was no electricity? Yeah, Senator, your point's well taken, and that's why we put into the policy to include critical infrastructure workers for local local officials. Because I think the, the point to remember is that um, it's the local official, the local emergency manager has the best knowledge and relationships in the local community about what the needs and critical requirements are. But all the power isn't generated locally, right? I mean, Agreed. We, we have a, a, a fairly complex and somewhat centralized uh, power industry. And I guess I'm not sure what local control could do positively or negatively to impact delivery of that of that supply of electricity during an emergency, which if the lights go out, I mean, if you're a hospital and the lights go out, uh, I don't care what other priorities that we've given to healthcare workers, they're in deep trouble if the lights go out. Uh, I, that's my concern about this. I think it's a great bill. I'm not trying to put you on the spot on this, but I'm just question. I'm right, trying to wrap my arms around why we wouldn't want to do this. I think the bill is written has some other problems, Senator. And, and uh, for example, it does say that in, in the bill itself that uh, this is on page two, beginning at line 14, priority access means it's access at least equal to that provided to hospital and medical personnel, law enforcement personnel, or other emergency responders. And all my argument here would be simply to say that it's that's best decided about that priority at the local level rather than uh, stating a mandate here in the, in the legislation itself. Thank you. Are there other questions from the committee members? Seeing none, thank you, sir, for being thank here. Thank you, Senator. Thank I appreciate you. it. Are there additional proponents? Okay. Seeing none, are there those who want to wish to testify in neutral? Okay, seeing none, there were uh, a total of four uh, letters 
and pro proponents zero and opposition zero and neutral. So, Senator, welcome back for your closing comments. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> All right, so we have no one who's written in in opposition. We have one who's testifying against it. I want you guys to remember, how many times does a director of an agency come into this body in opposition to a bill? That is very rare. Normally, they come in a neutral position. Now, if your job in life is to secure the safety of the people of Nebraska as a head of Nebraska Emergency Management, and what someone's trying to do is to help with the safety of those people, and you're going to come in in front of this body and speak in opposition to it, I think we've got some issues. Because, first off, the point that Senator Holler made was very well taken. In Nebraska, we have public power. NPPD, OPPD, LES. So we can't subdivide that down to every community. So saying local control is the reason this bill should be opposed is so wrong-headed. All we're saying is that the people that keep the power on need to have an equal footing and priority. And the point he made, I thought, was also well taken in imagine the world or Nebraska with the lights off. What all's affected? Now, your hospital may have generators for a while, but your law enforcement facilities, your fire facilities, some of those are limited at best, especially as you get to small towns. So if that effort that you're trying to make is not well coordinated with those power companies, how's that going to work? Are you going to have 250 towns calling them saying, hey, hey, hey? Or are you going to have a, a law that establishes a priority and a, and, a, and a way of doing it so that you can safely conduct operations in an emergency? I, t I am just dumbfounded that that is a position that the emergency management has taken on this issue. This is, not, this is not something that we die on the hill fighting over because it's not changing anything but to help, not hurt. How do you think your local folks are going to react to this policy? They're going to embrace it. Okay, fine. we got firemen. we got policemen. We, we've got critical folks in the medical side, and we're going to include critical infrastructure workers. How is that going to change your ability to react in these communities? It's not. It's going to help you to have a more of a, a synchronized reaction. I'm open for questions. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Are there questions from the committee? Seeing that, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, have a great day. Be well. With that, uh, I declare a fair and clear hearing on 265. 267, I'm sorry. We will now proceed to LB 161 with Senator McDonald. Thank you, Chairman Reapy. Members of the committee, my name is Mike McDonald, M I K E M C D O N N E L L. I represent Legislative District 5, South Omaha. I introduce LB 161, which re relates to the Workplace Privacy Act and the ability of employers to track their employees. Recently, during the pandemic, we found ourselves in a new territory that we have never been in before. Technology was utilized to provide businesses with the ability to remain op operational during the public health emergency. Part of that technology was used to track where employees were working, but in certain instances, it was also carried beyond the workplace and into their after hours personal lives. I believe that we all deserve a certain level of privacy on and off the clock. Certain technologies all allow exploitation of this privacy. No one disputes that during a public health emergency, certain precautions should be followed. But LB 161 is an effort to say that it should, when it should, and end and there. LB 161 presents no fiscal impact to the state of, and provides steps towards protecting employees' privacy. Um, John Nebel is going to be here to testify. He's, he's with IBW 22 in, in Omaha, International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers. Um, this is kind of common sense. Uh, the idea of during a, a, a emergency, health emergency, sure, we want to know where, where people are moving, who's having contact, therefore we can notify, God bless you, we can notify um, 
that, that someone has been in contact and, and try to, to, to try to prevent that. But also at, at the same time, we've got uh, things going on where people could take advantage of it. Um, they could use it for other means besides public health. Um, this does not affect your, your GPSing on your, your vehicles right now that the state currently has, but it is for private and public uh, sector um, employees. And I'm gonna be here to, to answer your questions and I'll be here to close. Thank you, sir. Other questions from the committee? You must have done a good job. Thank you. Are there uh, proponents in support of LB-161? If you would, sir, state your name, spell it, and who you represent. Okay. Uh, my name is John Nebel, J-O-N-N-E-B-E-L. I am a business representative for the International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers, Local 22, and president of the Nebraska State Council of Electrical Workers, representing over 5,000 uh, Nebraska workers and their families. My goal today is to uh, explain to you why a union member is uh, going to advocate for less workers' rights uh, going forward. Uh, to me, the, uh, the road to hell begins uh, with good intentions. And if I could reset back a couple years to the start of this pandemic, I want to explain what those intentions started off as. If, uh, I, I think we're all wondering how COVID-19 was going to come to uh, come to Nebraska. And I remember watching on the news one night uh, that uh, a person had been uh, tested positive with COVID and they were at a Walmart, uh, and that's how we kind of found out what contact tracing was. I think by the end of the night, we found out that she was at all the Walmarts and maybe bought up all the toilet paper or whatever the case was. But I think we all realized that we we're in a situation that we'd never been in before, and uh, it was going to create a lot of animosity in the workplace because there were certain people that wanted to protect themselves and other people that wanted to protect their business and their way of life. Uh, 161 provides an avenue through technology that would allow contact tracing for specific purposes and uh, data to be stored and used under those guidelines and uh, only during a governor's uh, declared state of emergency of public health. The, uh, the other component about it is that we expanded uh, a little bit on the uh, description of an employer. Uh, in construction, we find ourselves in a kind of a unique circumstance where it's not just our direct employer, which is a, a subcontractor on a job site, but a general contractor and also the developer that have uh, have a workplace authority over whether or not we are allowed uh, to work on that site. So we wanted to make sure that that hierarchy was uh, explained in the bill so uh, all those folks could feel uh, the understanding of what we're trying to accomplish here. I'm available for any questions on how that looks. Thank you. Thank you for your presentation. Are there questions from the committee? Seeing none, we thank you very much for being here. Thank you. Additional proponents? Any more proponents? Those speaking in favor? Looks like we have one coming. We'd ask you if you're speaking as a proponent or an opponent uh, or neutral, please come forward up in the front row so we can move along. Thank you for being here. If you'd be kind enough to state your name, spell it, and then who you represent, we'll go forward. Hi, my name is Felicia Hilton, uh, F-E-L-I-C-I-A. I'm with the North Central States Regional Council of Carpenters. Okay, please come forward. All right. Um, I'm testifying in favor of the, this bill. Um, we agree that privacy is really important um, and appreciate Senator McDonald bringing this legislation forward. Um, I just wanted I just wanted to speak to a couple of um, uh, clarifications that hopefully we're able to um, figure out today. Um, but one of them was uh, I see, in section one of the bill where it's describing um, the devices. Um, I just wanted to be clear that it's including uh, downloaded applications, even though it's saying online internet access um, to be to clarify applications. Um, and then further on when it's saying um, the device has to be worn, 
Um, I know there are some employers that require you to download their employee app um, for tracking as well. And I wasn't clear if that was uh, laid out in the bill. Um, I know it covers cellular devices um, and, uh, you know, internet um, access and logins and uh, of those of that nature. But wanted to really be clear that it includes um, applications that can be downloaded onto your phone. Um, used to, obviously, it has your, your cellular data um, as part of the device. But when it explicitly says warn, um, I just wasn't clear if that was including um, applications on the phone as well or a company's app or your employer's app. Okay. Thank you. If you'll wait just a second here, we're going to see if there are any questions from the committee. Any questions per se? The only question I would have is while you're testifying as a proponent, you seem to have had some concerns. Have you worked those out with Senator McConnell's staff? No, I just I just saw the bill and wanted to clarify. I've seen these types of bills um, in other states, and so um, having applications, um, I just okay. threw that out there. As a committee, we would ask you to, to work with him yep. to see if those can be resolved. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? Seeing none, thank you very much. Are there more proponents? Are there opponents? If you would please, your name, phone. Thank you, Chairman Reapy and members of the committee. My name is Ansley Fellers, A-N-S-L-E-Y-F-E-L-L-E-R-S. -E -E and I'm here on behalf of the Nebraska Grocery Industry Association and the Nebraska Petroleum Marketers and Convenience Store Association. We're testifying in opposition to LB-161. First, I want to say that all the employers I represent take employee privacy as well as state and federal laws very seriously. In listening to Senator McDonald, it seems monitoring workers off the clock is the primary focus, but our employers are concerned. Um, they use electronic means to track employee productivity and throughout the day in places like warehouses, and they think they'll certainly be impacted. Certain industries rely on employee tracking software or devices for things like picking and receiving and usually pay bonuses for meeting certain goals. It's unclear whether these employers were necessarily the target of LB-161, but it appears their processes would be impacted. We're willing to work with Senator McDonald and other stakeholders to ensure technology can continue to be utilized to improve efficiency, accountability, and safety. But we would ask the committee not advance LB-161 as written. Thank you for your time. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much. Are there questions from the committee? Seeing none, I would ask the simple question of, do you have options that you would be workarounds in terms of in the event that this would become law? You know, I'm not sure. I think that probably utilizing it, you know, it says electronics, and I would imagine that's kind of the best, most advanced way of tracking employee productivity. And so, and it, it seems very broad. So I think it would be difficult to probably find a workaround at this point. Okay. Are there additional questions? Seeing none, thank you very much. Thank you. Are there additional opponents? Okay. Seeing none, or is there anyone that wishes to testify in a neutral capacity? Seeing, seeing none, Senator, you're welcome back for your closing remarks should you choose. Uh, thank you, and we will work with. Uh, uh, anyone that has uh, concerns about the bill or, or listen to ways to improve it and of course with members of the committee and uh, we're, we're open to ideas. So thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Senator Blood. Thank you, Chair. And Senator McDonald, I'm sorry I missed your intro, but I read through it and I have a couple of questions. So they've been asked already. I apologize. Um, so what electronic devices were being warned that were tracking travel patterns outside of work? Well, based on, uh, as I, in my opening, I mentioned, <clears throat> if you look at a personal electronic device, and, and I believe... Like a phone? Uh, or? Phone, well, my iWatch, my... But if we, we wanted to make sure that was clear that with the GPS on, for example, a, like a, a vehicle, 
-hmm. that does not affect this bill. It was more of the idea that, and at the time, and, and still we agree with the process of, for a public health crisis, that you should be tracking, for example, if you and I had contact and we're at the widget making company and, and I end up with COVID later that day, that you want to be notified that, you know, potentially you've been exposed to someone with COVID. So the, the practical use of it in an emergency situation, we agree with. It's the idea that after work hours outside of, for example, my um, GPS on my a truck, let's say, that I'm working for the widget making company and I bring it home, of course they can track that. Right. Um, so we're concerned and I believe uh, uh, Felicia Hilton brought up a, a good point was let's let's define exactly how we do that with an eye watch, a, uh, a, a phone. Let's make sure we define it more clearly. And, and that's one of the concerns I have, too, is that I, I, I think when it comes to technology, especially since it moves so quickly, how it's defined is going to make a difference about whether this, this bill is able to go beyond what I mean, technology changes in the blink of an eye. And then... Um, I mean, the concern is, is that, I mean, they pretty much everything that you have electronically is being tracked, not necessarily by your employer, but by somebody. Um, and I don't think people understand that. So I, I'm hoping that you'll talk to me about this. I think there's some, definitely some definition that um, that is really broad, and I'm not sure it's going to protect anybody if you don't better define it. Yeah, we definitely can meet, and I'm open to any ideas on how to improve the legislation. Thank you. Senator Blood, any additional questions? Senator Blood? Oh, any, no. I'm sorry, any additional questions? Nope. Sorry, I was like thinking about what he said. No, that's good. <laughs> uh, Senator, uh, please. Thank you, Senator Repeat. Thank you, Senator McDonald. Um, what would you say to concerns about privacy around this bill and privacy protections? That's the main concern that I've heard from Nebraskans and also from many state employees have reached out to my office to ask me specifically about this bill. So let's give the example of what we just all lived through. Governor declares an emergency and we're using this information and the tracking's going on and, and for the right purposes. In the legislation, we put that within 48 hours of the governor ending that emergency, all that, that data that's been collected on that individual employee should be erased, um, should not remain in their personnel file. So I think there's a, a balance here based on the idea of using it in the right way especially during an emergency, uh, but at the same time, uh, not using it to possibly track someone. Uh, for example, you and I had a discussion, I'm using the widget making floor again, uh, for three minutes and 12 seconds. Well, what were they talking about? This is after the pandemic. Um, the idea of using that and having it in our personnel files, that's what I believe concerns a number of people, where they want to go to, to work, they want to do their jobs, they want to be treated with dignity and respect. And at the same time, I think when people have an opportunity to participate in keeping each other safe and healthy during a pandemic, they do step forward and they do understand that. But after the fact, again, in this legislation, it'd be 48 hours after the pandemic is over, after the governor declares it's over, then at that point, everything would have to be erased. If I understand people's concerns, I think what the concern is, isn't that, um, you know, our employer could see that you and I had a conversation for three minutes and 12 seconds. And if that was erased after the pandemic or whatever event, then we should feel reassured by that. I think the insecurity and the worry is that that data would be collected at all. And um, are you talking about I, Senator during the during a, uh, a public health crisis or or yes, we're talking about which, during yes. the public health crisis, we understand it's that after the public health crisis ends and the governor declares that emergency over, that's what this bill is trying to address. Right. I understand that. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Hunt. Any other additional questions? Thank you, Senator, very much. Thank you. Appreciate it. I would, for the record, there were zero proponents in the form of letters, one opponent and zero neutral. So with that, I declare a full and fair hearing on LB-161. We will now proceed to LB-56 with Senator McKinney, who is a member of this committee. And with that, uh, he's not allowed as a committee member to participate in his own discussion of his bill other than to defend it and present it. So we're glad to have you here on the other side of the table. And we invite you to, you know the rules, uh, your name. And all right, forward, thank you. Um, good morning, Chair Reaper and uh, fellow members of the Business and Labor Committee. My name is Terrell McKinney. 
T E R R E L L M C K I N N E Y. And I represent the 11th, the 11th legis legislative district in Omaha. We're here to discuss LB 56, which if passed would adopt the diaper changing accommodation act, ensuring safe, sanitary, convenient, and publicly accessible baby diaper changing stations are widely available throughout the state for use by both men and women is a matter of statewide concern and a beneficial public policy. As a father, I remember dreading being in public alone with my daughter when she needed her diaper change when she was young. Changing a baby girl in a men's restroom is inconvenient, uncomfortable, not necessarily safe, and it's not always sanitary. Without a baby, without a changing table, you're only left with a few options. Do you change the diaper on the floor, the sink counter, or a tight stall? The establishments that offer this common sense approach are few and far between. After introducing last year LB 815, I received an outpour of comments from fellow fathers expressing their support and sharing their stories. One of those stories was that a dad had to change a diaper on the restroom floor because it lacked the accommodation of a changing table. What once worked then isn't necessarily working now. Our family demographics, demographics are changing and evolving. Men are becoming more involved in their child's primary care and the number of same-sex households with children are increasing. This accommodation doesn't apply to one sector of our population anymore. This is an inconvenience to us all. In 2016, Congress passed the Bathroom, the, the bathroom Accessible in Every Situation Act, the Babies Act, which requires baby changing accommodations in both male and female restrooms located in publicly accessible federal buildings. States with similar legislation, Wisconsin, Illinois, Michigan, New York, Rhode Island, Nevada, California, Arizona, New Mexico, and, and Oklahoma. And our state should join this list, especially if we are to live by our motto, the good life. The good life should mean that we put the end put an end to babies cha being changed on gas station floors or in cramped bathroom stalls. Um, last year, this was advanced out of committee, and I truly believe this is a necessary and common sense piece of legislation. I encourage you to move this bill forward, and I'm open to any questions. Thank you, Senator. Other questions from the committee? Senator Blood. Thank you for bringing that bill forward again. Just real quickly, did I miss how many other states are doing this? Because I know there's been a big movement. Uh, it is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Ten. Yeah. Ten more to come. I'm sure. Thank you. No problem. All right. Are Thank there additional questions? I have a, a question. Uh, just maybe in the reading here, but is this apply to the state capital as well? It, I'm just thinking, wondering what. It most likely could. Mr. Ripley would have some questions and concerns. I mean, I, I, I don't see a concern. I would think that, you know, bathrooms in the Capitol should have changing tables too. Uh, I mean, we're remodeling the Capitol right now. And maybe, maybe he can find some antique ones yeah. or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> the antique changing table is the mom stays home. That's right. <laughs> That's what that is. Um, just to chime in, the the women's restrooms in the Capitol don't have changing tables either. So oh, that's, um, uh, that's for everybody. Thank you, Senator <laughs> McKinney. No problem. Do you have any idea the extent of the burden on uh, small businesses that uh, might be required? Uh, I don't think there will be a burden necessarily. I mean, it's pertaining to new construction and things like that when they remodel. So, I mean, you just take that into account. I don't know the price of changing tables but I would assume it's not a significant cost. Senator Hunt. Thank you, Senator Reapy. I wonder if you could speak to, or anybody coming after you to testify, the potential benefits a small business could see by having facilities that cater to all of their customers. When I, I have a child too, and when my kid was really little and in diapers, my husband and I, sometimes would specifically avoid places if we had the baby with us that we knew he couldn't change the baby because our deal was I fed the baby and he changed the baby and every couple has their own system and stuff but um, that was his contribution to the family is he kind of did all the diapers and so um, you know we we support a lot of small local businesses but I recall specifically avoiding ones where we knew he couldn't change the baby 
Right. I think it would definitely be a benefit to locals, to small businesses and businesses, period, in the state, because as you just stated, if I'm a father and I got my daughter one day and I have to do work at a coffee shop or have a meeting and I have to have her with me and there's no change at table, I'm probably going to suggest going somewhere else because I'm not going to feel comfortable taking her into a restaurant, men's restroom, for one, two, and I'm not going to change her on the floor. That's just not the greatest experience for her and I. But Senator Hunt, did you feel that you or your husband had the better end of the deal? No pun intended. <laughs> I think it was a, a good equal balance of labor. Okay, fair enough. Are there other questions of Senator McKinney? Chairman Hill. Senator Hanson. Yes, thank you, Chairman McKinney. So, do you see the fiscal note on this? And I didn't know if this is. So I'm looking at the fiscal note that the legislative fiscal analyst did, and they're they're saying the cost kind of vary quite a bit. I don't know if this is just for the state building or the office capital commission building or whatever improvements they're gonna be doing. They said it costs was about between five fifty and six hundred dollars. And then the office of the capital commission says the average cost of changing station averages two thousand dollars per installation. Do you think that'd be similar for like a small business? Is that how much it costs? I just don't know if you saw that if that's terrible or I'm not, I'm not sure. I would have to see where they got that estimate from to give you a better answer. I just wonder. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. Okay. Are there any other questions from the committee? Hearing none. Thank you, sir. Are there uh, proponents, if you will? It'll be fifty six. you would state your name spell it please and who you represent thank you chairman reby members of the business and labor committee my name is erin feichtinger e-r-i-n-f-e-i-c-h-t-i-n-g-e-r and i am the policy director of the women's fund of omaha we support lb56 and thank senator mckinney um, for bringing this back on average, a baby needs to have its diaper changed um, six to 10 times a day for parents who have their baby with them while grocery shopping at the store, grabbing a meal at a restaurant. This likely means needing to change their child's diaper while on the go. Women's restrooms um, offer diaper changing tables for female caregivers, but the dearth of tables in men's restrooms serves as a challenge and um, an inequity that male caregivers face when needing to change their child's diaper. As Senator McKinney described with his own child, um, my husband has similar uh, horror stories of taking our baby out um, and not having a place to change her. Uh, diapering is not solely a woman's issue. The growing number of fathers as primary caregivers or stay-at-home dads indicates that many, many male caregivers are equally, if not fully, responsible for parenting responsibilities like diapering. As such, they should be given the appropriate resources to take care of their children's needs. Um, for single fathers, fathers in same-sex partnerships, and even male relatives like grandfathers, um, my daughter's grandfather takes her out quite frequently. <laughs> Um, the need for diaper changing tables is even more pronounced. Without diaper changing table available to them, male caregivers are often forced to change their baby's diaper on unsanitary floors or sink counters, which can be um, even dangerous for the baby. Or in the stroller, if they happen to bring one while out running an errand, and none of these scenarios are ideal. Diapering is also an opportunity for parents to bond with their children. Research demonstrates that fathers who engage in the day-to-day -day caregiving of their babies experience the benefits of bonding with their children and have positive impacts on their relationships with their partners. So let's close the diaper changing gap this year and ensure that male caregivers are not shut out from being able to perform an important and necess necessary task for the well-being of their babies. The Women's Fund fully supports this legislation and respectfully urges this committee to do so as well. And I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you for being here. Are there questions from the committee? Hearing none, thank you very much. Are there additional proponents? You would please state your name yep. and spell it. Uh, Scout Richters, S-C-O-U-T-R-I-C-H-T-E-R-S, here on behalf of the ACLU of Nebraska in support of LB56. 
Um, we first want to thank Senator McKinney for bringing this legislation. Uh, the ACLU of Nebraska works to ensure that every, everyone, regardless of their gender, has an equal opportunity uh, to work and participate in family life according to their own needs um, and has the ability to make the decisions that are best for their own lives and their, their families. Um, as you've heard, um, LB 56 ensures that all people, regardless of the restrooms they use, will have the ability to change their child's diaper in a safe and hygienic environment. Again, as you heard, um, this disparity in locations of current diaper changing stations um, creates a near impossible situation for um, single fathers, same-sex male partners, and other male identifying caregivers. Um, one where when they enter a building, um, they know it's unlikely that they will be able to hygienically change a diaper. Without diaper changing stations in all restrooms, um, Nebraska really upholds unhelpful uh, gender norms and stereotypes um, that are becoming increasingly outdated. In advancing LB56, Nebraska would empower male ca caregivers while simultaneously easing that still lopsided uh, burden on female caregivers. So. Um, I think at a time when, um, as Senator Blood asked, when the national dialogue around this issue is, is really growing um, and Nebraska consistently strives to have the best outcomes for our children, um, this, this state should be a leader in promoting gender equity in all areas of public life, including providing male caregivers of young children the same opportunities as their female counterparts. So, we strongly support this bill and urge urge its advancement, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Okay, thank you for your presentation. Are there questions from the committee? Senator Hunt, please. Thank you, Chairman Reapy. Good to see you. Good Mr. to see you. One common point of opposition I've heard in my time here about bills like this, which would sometimes relate to like you have to have a gender neutral restroom. You have to, like any kind of um, accommodation that is a government mandate mm -hmm. that could be seen this way. I, as a small business owner myself, am usually kind of sympathetic to those criticisms right. because yeah, I mean, I do, I work here and then I have a real job where I don't make any money either. And we all put our blood, sweat and tears into these things to make it successful and support our families. And it's a huge risk to be an entrepreneur and on and on and on. We all know this. Um, <coughs> so the government coming and telling you, okay, you have to spend, you know, maybe $2,000 or whatever fiscal thinks that a diaper changing table costs, you know, that's a huge burden on a small business, but, um, I was wondering if you could speak to some of the interesting exemptions in the bill that I think actually make this pretty palatable and like really reasonable and a really middle of the road thing that most small business owners could support. For example, um, the bill says that uh, places of public accommodation constructed or substantially renovated after the operative of this act, it only applies mm -hmm. to them. It creates an exemption on page four, line seven, um, saying that if installing a changing table is not feasible or would result in a failure to comply with building standards or regulations or right of access for persons with disabilities and things like that, then an exemption can be made. Um, can you speak to kind of the, if you feel this bill is, is reasonable for our culture in Nebraska, as, right. you know, a culture of supporting small business owners. And yeah, exactly. As you said, I think that because it's, it's, and, and Senator McKinney mentioned this too, it's going forward, new buildings are substantially renovated. It, it signals that, um, you know, it's, it's where we want the future to be as far as um, ensuring equity between male and female caregivers without um, putting businesses in a situation where they're not going to be able to keep their doors open to, to meet these needs. And I think, um, it, like you said, it has a lot of um, things like that where um, it, it's feasible and it's, um, it's something that would, would benefit all Nebraskans. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Are there additional questions? Thank you very much. Thank you. For your testimony. Are there additional proponents?
I've seen you here before, so I'm not going hey, to Hey, long time no see. <laughs> Uh, Edison McDonald, E-D-I-S-O-N, M-C-D-O, and A-L-D, representing the ARC of Nebraska. We advocate for people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. Uh, I'll keep my comments brief this morning. I think that uh, the, the previous testifiers have really elaborated on the importance of this. I'll just speak from my own experience. There's nothing like breaking a bathroom sink trying to change a kid on top of it. Um, and I think that this really is an important piece, not only for young children, but for our members. This is a lifetime experience for so many of them. They will continue to need to use diapers even as an adult. Um, and so making sure, like Iowa's done, uh, within, their, um, within their rest stops along the interstate, that there are adult accommodated changing tables is important too. Otherwise our members really do have to think through and say, which bathroom can I go to and really plan out where their trips are going to be and it limits how they can travel, where they can go, what businesses they can go to and how they can participate in our community. So uh, we thank Senator McKinney for this bill and the committee for their time and uh, any questions. Thank you. Thank you. If you'll hold on just a second, you know the routine. Okay. Are there any members that have questions? I have a question. You mm -hmm. commented on, I think the word you used, adult. So yes. we're talking about weight limits. Is, is that maybe a concern? Yeah. Uh, so so we would have to so go they're, to the maximum are. capacity as opposed to the least. So then we end up in a whole new arena of what those costs would be in terms of reinforcement walls, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, and and you're right. Um, and, and you know, I can't speak to the pricing difference between the two, just that for our members, they will need frequently those adult changing tables and not just the, the child ones. Can you that help us out on what, what would that weight? I mean, are we talking about 50 pounds or are we talking about uh, seven? I mean, we're talking about adults. We're adults. talking about folks who are going to be a couple hundred pounds. Could be a couple hundred pounds. Yeah. Yikes. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. I uh, appreciate that. Thank you. That's insightful. Additional proponents? Hearing none. Are there opponents? Seeing none. Are there any wishing to testify in a neutral capacity? Senator McKinney, you're welcome to come back and close. Thank you, and thank you to all that came and spoke in support of LB56. Um, as I was sitting here, I was looking online at different price ranges for diaper changing stations. Some was as low as $150, and I saw one as high as like $350 or something. So the prices vary. Um, I'm sure they probably researched the most expensive one. Um, I'll also say that all baby changing mounts come with specific mounting instructions designed to ensure that the unit is installed according to compliance standards by the ADA and CPSIA, the Consumer Product Safety Improvement Act. And I think, you know, this is a great bill to be passed. I think it's a benefit to all Nebraskans to have something like this in place. And, you know, as our state continues to grow, We'll need things like this to not only, you know, keep people here and track people, but but also show that Nebraska is really open to all, and 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 that's what I think is important. Thank you. Thank you very much. Are there questions from the committee? Senator Hanson, please. Thank you, Chairman. Yeah, about 150 bucks. I looked it up too on Amazon. So <laughs> <laughs> I didn't list all those on Amazon. So yeah. you're right. Uh, and yeah, there were some of the pretty expensive ones too. Uh, when you when you say the the they have to shell include signage, does that anything specific? Do they put like that's just putting up something that says we have a change in table okay. inside? Yeah, I'm just curious yeah. with that, and that. And I don't know if you said this in your opening, but are these already mandated for public, like government establishments? Federal. Right? There was a federal bill that was passed in 2016, but that's just only related to federal buildings. Okay. Yeah. Up, no, you kind of let Senator Hunt mention too. 
just different aspect. I'm not a huge fan of like incorporating this in a private business, but maybe in, with public entities like, you know, um, interstate stations or, you know, public institutions, I'm probably totally against that. But, so I was just kind of curious about the signage part. So thank you. All right. No problem. Are there any other questions from the committee? No. Thank you very much. Uh, we did have letters of proponents, seven letters in support and one letter in opposition and zero neutral. So I right. done a nice job. Thank you very much. With that, I declare a fair and a hearing on LB 56 and we will proceed forward to LB 57. Good morning, Chairman Reedy and members of the Business and Labor Committee. My name is Michaela Cavanaugh, M-A-C-H-A-E-L-A-C-A-V-A-N-A-U-G-H, representing District 6 in West Central Omaha, Douglas County. And I'm here this morning to introduce LB57. Um, I'd like to say, I, thankfully, I didn't testify on that last bill, but I have lots of funny stories that involve poop and changing tables. So if you ever want to hear them, I'm, I'm happy to share. Uh, also, my father once traveled with a newborn uh, with his friend, another colleague in the U.S. Congress, and I'm pretty sure it would make for a great buddy comedy movie, but uh, I can have him submit his own testimony for Senator uh, McKinney's previous bill. So... This is my paid family medical leave bill. Rigorous research studies show that access to paid leave boosts maternal labor workforce attachment, increases a family's economic security, improves maternal mental health, fosters better parent-child relationships, supports child health and development, improves retention of trained employees, correlates with reduced emergency room use. As a mom, I appreciate the opportunities I have been afforded to have good medical care and a job with generous salary and benefit package because when my children were born, I had paid time off. That is actually not the norm. Many mothers and fathers have to take time off, time of off unpaid after a child is born or use up sick and vacation time. In fact, employees who work for the same employer as I did were not afforded the same benefit I had because they were at a lower wage where the benefit package didn't include paid time off. That is more often the case. The higher the wage, the more often paid, the more often paid time is off is included in the benefit package. Hundreds of thousands of workers who are also family caretakers, both male and female, are forced every year to take time off of work unpaid to care for a family member or themselves. Studies have shown that caretakers who have the option of having paid family medical leave are more likely to stay in the workforce instead of feeling like they are forced out of their jobs and into a caretaking role full time. Paid family medical leave is a tool to recruit workers with young families and to retain and keep workers from employee turnover. Federal family medical leave is a, is a placeholder to keep a job and benefits but, but does not have the reimbursement mechanism. It helps to save a job you want to return to or an equivalent job, but does not help with partial replacement of wage. LB 57 proposes a statewide plan that would have, the, have many of the same definitions and protections as the federal law, but it includes a partial wage reimbursement. Here's how LB 57 proposes to do this. The program administration agency is, is the Department of Labor. The Commissioner of Labor will promulgate rules and regulations, create forms, handle complaints, issue related notices, and make determinations related to the Paid Family Medical Leave Act. LB 57 would include all Nebraska employers subject to the Employment Security Act with two differences. Self-insured employers with private benefits equal to or better than those required in LB 57 can opt, can opt out. However, any complaints would be dealt with by the Commissioner of Labor using the Administrative Procedures Act, and self-employed persons could opt out. An individual employee may be eligible for the paid family and medical leave. All individual employees may, would be eligible. Any, there would be a one-week waiting period. Paid family medical leave could be granted up to 12 weeks for full-time or in, intermittent for serious health conditions of family members, military uh, 
emergency leave, or when a new family member arrives. Family members are defined to include the covered individual employee, spouse of covered individual, a child of the covered individual or their spouse, whether biological, foster, adoptive, step, legal ward, or person to whom the covered individual or their spouse stood in local parentis, regardless of their age. Grandparent, grandchild, sibling, whether biological, foster, adoptive, or step, relationship, or legal ward of covered individual or the covered individual spouse. Newborn biological child and newly placed foster or adopted child. Military family member for qualified emergency leave. Other, one other person designated by the covered individual as a family member. Pay family medical leave benefit for and benefit for and responsibilities of covered employees. The employee is assured the same job or a similar job with equal pay upon return. The employee may take leave under the federal FMLA concurrently with the paid family medical leave allowed by this act. A covered individual found to have presented false statements or misrepresentations is disqualified from the paid family leave program for one year. Benefits paid erroneously may be reclaimed by the commissioner or used as an offset to future payments. Employer responsibilities. The employer must provide information about paid family medical leave to all employees. Employers shall maintain health benefits for individual employee if the covered individual continues to pay the covered individual's share of cost as required prior to commencement of leave. Employer cannot require an employee to exhaust accrued vacation or sick time prior to taking the leave. Retaliatory personal action by employer against employee for taking the leave is prohibited. An employer found to be in violation of this act may be issued a citation that could result in a fine up to 500 for a first violation and up to 5,000 for subsequent violations. The employer will have the right to appeal. On an annual basis, the commissioner will determine the level of contributions required of employers to cover the expenses of the leave program. In no case shall the contributions required from an employer exceed 1% of the gross wages paid, not including the startup costs. It, estimates for employer contributions would be around half a percent of wages paid. The Women's Fund of Omaha has created a formula for estimating the cost to an employer and the possible benefits to an employer. The calculation shows that over time, the employer will gain more financial benefit from the leave program than it spends to be part of the program. Let me say that again, it shows a financial gain for the employer over time. Calculation of benefits. The leave benefits are calculated on the percentage of the individual's average weekly wage as compared to the state average weekly wage. Example, if the average state weekly wage is $671, the leave benefit for the individual wages at or below, that would be calculated at 90%. For individual wages above $671, the leave benefit would be calculated at 50%. Leave benefits shall not be paid at the same time an individual is receiving workers' compensation benefits for total disability or unemployment benefits. LB57 proposes to borrow the startup costs from the health care cash fund to be repaid when the family leave, when the program has sufficient funds, but no later than October 1, 2027. Paid family medical leave is needed now more than ever. I ask you to advance LB57. I do have some comments on the fiscal note that I would like to address before uh, opening for questions. So um, if you have access to the fiscal note, the estimates are based on maximum levels. Therefore, the Department of Labor estimates revenue in the first full year at 543 million, but ex expenditures only at 200 million. They would only need to cover expenses and administration. So the amount of employer contributions could be reduced as much as the bill is designed to adjust the rate of contributions based on experience of claims paid. The estimates of Rhode Island used as an example state are from 2021. 2021 was a big COVID-19 year, so not sure how accurate the example is. Comparing it to the previous introduced, introduced bill and fiscal note, the experience of that state is higher, of that state is higher in this estimate by about 8 million, and there are 2,500 more claims while the estimated population of the state actually went down. So I suggest there is a COVID effect in the estimates. The department also says a separate fund needs, a separate fund needs to be created for administrative costs. However, on page 10, line 14, it clearly states that the leave insurance fund created in the bill can be used for administrative costs. I think that's it. <laughs> Thank you very much. Happy to take Are there questions? questions from the committee? 
Senator Hunt, please. Thank you, Chairman Reapy. Um, I want to start asking you a question, Senator Kavanaugh, that I'll ask of other testifiers as well. Um, during this pandemic, we know that it disproportionately harmed essential workers and a lot of them women, people of color, people in caregiving professions, low wage workers. And a lot of these workers faced higher rates of illness because they couldn't work from home. And even though the pandemic is debatably over less happening, somewhat less severe, depending on your experience, um, a lot of people in these low wage sectors still don't have access to paid leave or be able to work from home or any of the things that allow them to recover from illness um, or take care of the children that they have at home. So based on your expertise, and I say expertise because you've worked in this field prior to being elected, you've brought this bill before, you've worked on this bill for many years, um, and you know I've worked on the same bills lots and lots of times, and I feel like that's given me a lot of subject matter expertise too, but based on your expertise, how would having a state policy since we don't yet have a national policy, benefit these essential workers and low wage workers in Nebraska? Thank you so much for that question. So having a state policy, much like we have a state unemployment insurance fund, it, it creates, uh, you know, the more people that participate, the, the cost is shared across, across the board. So when we have low wage workers, <coughs> Um, and oftentimes they might work for a smaller employer or a larger employer, but this is, creates an opportunity to give them some, some sense of income when they have these qualifying events. And I say qualifying events because that, that's oftentimes a, a question as to, well, how do you qualify for this? We have very prescribed uh, guidelines for family medical leave at the federal level. You cannot qualify for the paid leave if you don't qualify for the prescribed federal leave. So it has to be a qualifying event. It has to be a qualifying individual. It's not something that is easily, of course, everything has um, weaknesses, but it's not easily abused. Um, but so more to the point is that by doing a statewide program, we are ensuring that every citizen is having equal access to the opportunity to take off this essential time, whether it's COVID related or medically related. And as we have an aging population, I believe we'll have AARP testifying here and we have individuals becoming caregivers. Um, you know, we have our, our, the greatest generation is becoming the retired generation and, and needing more having medical needs. And, uh, and so this is going to be a big a big issue in Nebraska as far as caregiver goes. We also have a, an increase in uh, childhood cancer in Nebraska, which is a devastating fact. And families, parents need to be able to be with their children, especially if they're not in the Omaha area and they need to be bringing their children to the hospital in the Omaha area for treatment. We need to be able mm -hmm. to support our workforce so that they can stay in the workforce. And that is an expensive thing to do. And I think it requires all of us. So this is a public good. Well, speaking about workforce, I had an interesting conversation with a colleague in another state um, late last year. And we were talking about states growing economy and competitiveness and sort of ostensibly all of the different policies that we pass at the state level to increase our competitiveness among other states. And one of the things we talked about was the challenges that women have faced in employment. And in the United States, you know, not just talking about the state level, but our country, women have had more participation in the workforce than Europe and Asia historically. But those numbers are starting to fall and we're now behind those countries um, in large part because um, of the lack of a family leave policy, both nationally and state to state. So as we're talking about it, um, just talking about competitiveness between states, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about this, about how a lack of a state family leave policy is contributing to Nebraska's lack of competitiveness nationwide between other states. Well, if we're trying to recruit a workforce to come to Nebraska and we're trying to recruit people to come from places like Chicago or anywhere in California at all, um, we're, we're, it's a big ask to ask people. I mean, it's four degrees this morning when I 
got in my car. <laughs> it's a big ask to ask somebody to move here from California to begin with, just the weather alone. Um, we have great things to offer a workforce here culturally and wonderful schools and lots of opportunities. But we um, have not done enough and not made enough strides to be friendly to working families. And if you are in that position, if you are in your 20s, 30s, 40s, and you have a young family, or you're planning to have a young family, you don't want to move to a state that's not going to be accommodating to you, especially if it's not your home state. I moved back to Nebraska because my parents are here, and I knew I wanted to have a family. And uh, my husband and I, we were living in Washington, D.C., and we knew that that wasn't realistic for us. So we moved back here because of family, not because of benefits of, that the state had. I would have probably moved back sooner if we had policies like this. I think some of my siblings that live out of state, by the way, I have seven siblings. So if you hear me talking about my siblings, there's a lot of them, uh, not just the one that serves with us. <laughs> um, so, you, you know, there, I would love for my sister in LA to move here, but I don't think she would ever move here because we don't have friendly policies like this. Um, and she does have that in California. And and really, if we want to have a workforce, we need to be workforce centric. And I don't believe that the policies that we have currently in the state do enough to focus on the workforce itself. So when we talk about recruitment and retention of our workforce, it's not just about how much our property taxes are or what our corporate taxes are. It's what are we doing to incentivize people, individuals, not, not companies to move here. I, we heard at our legislative council from uh, I think it was a, a mayor of us. I can't remember which city now. Um, do you recall? Was it Valentine? Go on. Uh, Go on. Okay. It might come to me. <laughs> yeah. So, and he talked about how they don't need more businesses in, in their community. They need workers mm -hmm. and they can't grow their business community because they can't out, they don't want to be outsized of their workforce. And right now, Nebraska is outsized of its workforce, and we need to be doing things, smart, strategic things, to address that. Um, I will say that I know I've, I've met with um, the Omaha Chamber, and they're going to come in opposition to this bill, and we have talked about it, and we are going to continue to work together to address these issues because I believe they, they also believe that this is an essential good for the people of Nebraska and for our workforce. Did you also say the AARP will be testifying? AARP is here to testify as well, yes. Okay. Um, last year, I passed... My priority bill, which is rare for me, I never get anything, so that was really fun. Congratulations. Thank you. Um, it was unemployment, per, uh, allowing caregivers to apply for unemployment benefits. Yes. And with so such a high percentage of the population um, aging in Nebraska, you know, our, our top demographic in age is growing mm -hmm. in Nebraska faster than other sectors of, of age and our demographic population. Um, how can a paid family leave bill help these caregivers who are increasingly having to care for aging Nebraskans they care for while holding down other jobs that may not offer them these benefits. Yeah, this would be great for keeping them in the workforce so that they don't have to leave the workforce and claim unemployment, which we already have a program for. They would have this other opportunity to, to claim the paid leave um, so that they can take care of their aging family member and still go back to their job. And so this is a great way to keep because basically the way it is now is if you have an if you're an employer and you have somebody who needs to leave to take care of somebody, they're going to quit because they can't afford to go just take the time unpaid off and you can't afford to pay them to take the time off because you're you're a small employer. All the business things you talked about previously with Senator McKinney's bill. Um, so this would offer them the opportunity to get paid a portion of their income while taking time off to be that caregiver and come back to the job. And that also means that the employer doesn't have to go through the expense and time of finding somebody to replace and train up for that job. So this would be a huge shift for the, that caregiver workforce. Thank you. Okay. Are there other questions from the committee? We have one. I guess. Hi. Thank you. Uh, thank you again for your testimony or for your bill. Um, can you outline any programs that might already exist comparatively or, or maybe not to the, to the extent that this one does, 
but that might already be in existence in that, the state. Mm -hmm. Okay. So in the state, there are individual employers that offer leave programs. Um, a lot of our larger employers offer leave programs, and this does make uh, exceptions for that, that they could then, if they offer to the same level of what the bill is, is asking for, that they would be exempt from participating in the program, or they could also shift, realizing that they might have cost savings by per, uh, participating in a statewide program. They could shift um, to offer the, their benefits through the statewide program. Um, I don't want to misspeak on which corporations have it. I, I do know that most of our larger uh, Fortune 500 com companies offer this um, because it's kind of a standard practice across the country to have a paid leave program. And then the University of Nebraska, which is where I worked previously to being here, um, they have a leave program for managerial level staff, but not hourly level staff. And they, uh, this could have changed already. I know that they were working on it. They're, their faculty board was working on uh, putting together a new policy that would be more reflective of something similar to this. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Senator Bullock. Thank you, Chair Rippey. How are you today, Senator Kavanaugh? I am terrific. Thank you. Um, I have a clarification question that I'm not sure I heard it in your introduction. So has it also been your experience that you find that in many businesses they say they have paid family leave, but what it really is is that if you've accumulated vacation or if you've accumulated sick leave, mm -hmm. then you can request paid family medical leave, but you're actually the one that pays for it, and so you have to live in fear that nobody ever gets sick again? <laughs> yes. So um, I don't know that they would characterize it as paid family medical leave. I think they, they would... promote it as such. Yes. I, 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 I oftentimes have heard people say that they have a generous leave policy. And my first question, whenever somebody says something is generous, is by whose standards is it generous? So um, we have seen more and more businesses trying to take be, take leadership roles on this. Um, back in 20, uh, whew, 2019, I believe it was, Senator Sue Crawford and I traveled the state with the Nebraska State Chamber and met with businesses to talk about how this would impact them. And it turned out that there were businesses already doing this, to your point. There was actually, um, it was a trucking business and we met with them in Kearney, I believe. And they they actually didn't understand that they were doing exactly what this is, offering a paid employer paid leave policy. They said, well, we do this, so why would we do that? And I was like, actually, this could cost, save you money or maybe it doesn't and you'd be exempt from it. But so there are companies that recognize that, you know, people are, people have hip surgery, people have knee replacement surgery. That would be a qualifying event. These are things that you are not going to physically show up to work for. If you have a job where you can't work remotely and you have knee surgery, you are not coming to work. So the question is, do we have a safety net program that ensures that you are receiving some income during that time that you absolutely are not going to be coming to work or do you have to quit and get unemployment which is a different safety net program but also costs the employer money so this is more thinking strategically and long term to address these issues i don't think i quite answered your question i kind of went off on my own answer I apologize did i answer your question i think you verified what i had to say okay. and then the second part of that question, based on all the many, many, many debates I've heard on this, because this comes back every year, um, and it and mistakenly never gets past first round, which is odd. Um, would you say that there's a bias? Because some, when people hear this, they think mostly of women and children as opposed to somebody who falls and breaks a hip or somebody has a spouse that's dealing with cancer who won't be able to work or generate income yeah. or um, from when I talk to people to me and maybe this is my impression there seems to be a bias which I think is actually very sad because that means then we don't value mothers and children either but <laughs> do you think that that might be part of the issue for this bill? I do think the M when you just say FMLA people think it's maternity right? Um, and it, it is so much more than maternity I will say that 
um, when I ran for the legislature, it was because of my passion for the specific policy and I was pregnant at the time. So it was a little hard to get people to understand then that it wasn't about maternity because, you know, when you have a woman sitting in front of you with a belly full of a kid, uh, you're going to assume that that's what it's about. But it is actually so much greater than that. It's about helping uh, really our, our aging um, individuals and our young families at the same time. And not everybody can do a GoFundMe page and hope that people pay their money, right? <laughs> I've never done one, so I, I assume not. Thank you, Senator. I had a question from the committee that said, I, I do have a question that was brought to my attention. It says the statute defines family member difference, different from federal guidelines by adding grandparent, grandchild, sibling, and one person designated by the covered individual as a family member. Is that is that the case? That that yeah. is in fact. Yes. It so um, so it ups the ante a little. It does up the ante a little. Um, we do know that grandparents oftentimes are caregivers mm -hmm. to their grandchildren, um, especially in this. In Nebraska, we now have an increase in kinship placements in our foster care system. And so in order to ensure that they are being covered, because when there is a kinship placement, they aren't getting other benefits, financial benefits to care for that child. So we want to make sure that those individuals who are caring for their, their grandchildren, especially in those types of situations, are included in this. We also may hear from, if we do have opposition, uh, Oh, I Actually, think we, we might have, have some opposition. <laughs> oh, I think one of the uh, individuals that responded to me, and they do consider that they have a quote-unquote Cadillac plan. They're an employer. And they said that they currently offer PTO for vacation and sick leave. They offer short-term and long-term disability plans. Yes. They also have a generous health, dental, and eye care plan for their employees. That's fantastic. They do, they do have a Cadillac plan. <laughs> And they do have employer-paid life insurance, 401k plan. Are they hiring? <laughs> <laughs> you have a job, a big job right I now. do have a big job, but it doesn't pay very job. well. <laughs> uh, they have a flexible spending account, health savings accounts. And they even have an employee earned hours based on time work, which can go into an extended illness bank, which then they are able to offer that up to fellow employees if the need arises. So their concern gets to be, so this becomes the other side of the coin, is their piece is they might have to give up some of those benefits to be able to justify this one, along with regulatory. I would give you an opportunity they, to respond to that. They would not have to do name. anything. They would opt out. That particular employer would qualify for opting out of the program. Okay. Are there, and I apologize for not knowing, are there stipulations within the the legislation that allow for opting out. Yes, if you offer. And who makes that decision? If you offer, I, it would be rules promulgated by the Department of Labor. Oh, okay. So we would. It's not prescribed specifically, um, but I try not to over prescribe uh, how the departments do things. Give a little, have a little faith and trust in their promulgation of rules and regs. But it would be um, done through the Department of Labor. But yes, if you offer a similar program. Um, then you could opt out okay. of, the, of this. So that employer, I mean, we could all model. After, we could, I could model it after them because they sound amazing. <laughs> Seriously, they're hiring. Yeah, that's, that's very good. Uh, are there any quest, other questions? Hearing none, thank you very much. Thank you. Nice job. I will now ask for proponents if you would come forward, and if you do intend to testify either as a proponent or an opponent, I'd ask you to. So in the interest of time to come up to the front, please. If you would be kind enough to state your name, spell it, and then who you represent, and please go forward. Hello, my name is Samantha Kenning, uh, S-A-M-A-N-T-H-A-K-E-N-N-I-N-G. I'm here for, for a proponent for LB57 on behalf of the Women's Health Advisory Council uh, government or governor appointed um, for the Legislative Committee. Um, it's imperative I start this testimony with a mutual understanding um, that life as we know it um, is not always fair, nor are we owed any of it. I try to teach my children through what seems like way too many lived experiences at the age of 32, 
that sometimes, no matter how hard you put your best foot forward, it doesn't mean all the stars will align to create the ultimate outcome desired. If I had known the day I took that pregnancy test back in July 2016 that those two lines would later mean a daughter who had to suffer uh, for no less than two years before losing her battle, I'd have made a few decisions differently, like find an employer with paid maternity leave. My daughter, Sydney Jo, was a rainbow to a dark storm endured prior to her arrival in March 2017. She was a prayer answered after multiple miscarriages and a light in the world during her four years of her life. Her daddy, a teacher, and I, a nurse, serving our communities until we're bone dry deep in student loan debt, simply wanted nothing more than time with our daughter and her two siblings without fear of having to file bankruptcy. Sydney's de uh, decline started around the time she turned 14 months old. She was developmentally on track until then, according to the standardized assessments. A request by me as her mother for a brain MRI due to her lack of balance and feet turning out while attempting to walk, we were hesitant at first due, the, due to the cost and potential denial from insurance. Our pediatrician trusted this mother's gut above all else. It was inconclusive. The brain changes so much during that time, the radiologist couldn't tell if anything was off. 18 months rolls around, genetic testing, countless consults uh, and specialists while also requiring orthotics. Then nerve testing and a muscle biopsy are done in Minnesota. We wait and we wait. It's determined Sydney definitely has some sort of muscular, muscular atrophy is issue, but the causation is unknown. She continues to not only not meet milestones anymore, but now she's actually what seemed to be declining. Her physical therapy sessions have become brutal to watch and ended in a vast amount of tears and a nap to end the sessions. Her full-time working parents to make ends meet are taking multiple days off of work a week to keep up with their medical appointments and therapy appointments, so I applied for intermittent FMLA. I could use my accrued vacation time or I could leave it unpaid. If you've, never had a, if you've ever had a family late in your 20s, you know there's almost no way to live without a paycheck. So my vacation time is what I take and I end up going part-time. Shortly after we had, we head to the NIH in Maryland to be part of a clinical study of other children with um, undiagnosed neuromuscular conditions. That girl, she was an angel as the ultimate traveler and doctor appointment goer. It often brought me to tears what all she had to go through. We apply for all the programs we can through the state and to get a secondary insurance for her, but all are denied. In September of 2019, Sydney's eyes started to appear to be rapidly shaking. It was a symptom I knew could not be good. The day of September 23rd, 2019 officially became the worst day of our lives. The only words I can recall from the doctor's mouth were, her brain is degenerating and you should apply for Make-A-Wish. Our, our perfect in our eyes daughter, Sydney, was wasting away before our eyes and there was absolutely nothing we as her parents or any doctor could do about it. How do we continue living our lives? Going back to work, paying the bills as if this isn't happening. We then reapply for state assistance as a secondary to our primary and finally are accepted due to her diagnosis of terminally ill. Fast forward to the week before Christmas of 2019, we head to CHOP in, in Pennsylvania, the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. The neurologist had strong suspicions our little girl had infantile neuroaxonal dystrophy but needed conclusive data before a formal diagnosis could be made. Sydney underwent more testing, but this time it was whole genome sequencing, the ultimate test there is available which cost $25,000 yeah, per person. Left, what was that? One minute left. Okay. Two months later, we flew back to Philly. Uh, Sydney, in fact, did have that genetic disorder that one out of every four of our children will have. A room full of highly qualified physicians that watched us coddle our daughter. Uh, we should put her on palliative care. She needs a feeding tube as soon as possible and spend every moment you can with her. She really was slowly dying before, slowly dying before our eyes. She began to lose the words she could speak, the sign language she once knew, she could no longer eat or drink or move. After 16 grueling months of hospice care with the most caring and loving nurses helping us care for, for her, she succumbed to this devastating disease um, in, the, in the summer of 2021, 2021 at the age of four. Let's be honest, if it weren't for her, I wouldn't be here today, um, sitting here testifying in front of you for paid, uh, to consider paid family leave. That's how important our children are to us as parents. Their future is all we live for and the air that breathes life back into our lungs. Yes, it appears society, yet it appears society encourages parents not to cherish their children by not having any paid family leave structure, structure built for them, even in the worst moments of their lives. Mother Teresa once said, if you want to bring happiness to the world, go home and love your family. And now I feel this to my core of my existence. Like I said prior, life's not fair, nor do I ever anticipate it being that way. 
I often ask myself what is in within my control. Can you kind of wrap up? Yep. Um, I recently overheard a quote, don't think of inheriting the earth from our ancestors. Think of it as re uh, renting it from our children. So I'm begging you, please consider investing in families of Nebraska. Thank you very much. Questions from the committee? I see Senator Blood down here. Thank you, Chair Reeby. And I'm sorry you were rushed through such a emotional testimony. I, I appreciate you coming forward and, and being so honest and open about what happened to you and your family. And I think it's really unfair Fortunate, and I'm leading to a question. I think it's really unfortunate that when we talk about things like paid family medical leave, that we talk about money because what value does a child have? And we hear that every single time we talk about abortion, right? So the, the question that I have for you since you were rushed through, what is the main point that you want to leave us with today that you want us to remember so when we go into executive session people aren't going to say oh look at this fiscal note we can't pass this mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you tell us something that's going to resonate with us forever besides this the story that again i thank you for sharing what would you say that would be what, would, what one thing would you like to leave us with that resonates with us forever It's really hard for me. Uh, I'm sorry. I know this is hard, but I want you to know that you being here is going to make a difference for other people, and that's powerful. There's really nothing I can bring my daughter back. But if there's anything I can do in my life is to promote other people to be able to get that time that I didn't get. Do we have tissues in this? I'm room sorry. Right now? Yeah. <laughs> I'm okay. We usually have tissues. No. Thank you. <sighs> I know money doesn't grow on trees. I really know that. If I hadn't have had people make a GoFundMe for me. Um, we definitely would have filed bankruptcy. Um, and we are definitely uh, people that have worked our whole lives and will continue to do so. Um, there's nothing like uh, wanting to keep people in the workforce, but also be able to support them as they're growing their family. Thank you very much. I think Senator Hunt has a question. Ms. Kenning, thank you for this testimony. I'm sorry you were rushed through it. Um, I'm glad we have this copy here so we can keep that with us potentially for floor debate too and to continue to build a record for um you know if we don't get this done this year future legislatures that will continue to look at this issue um i have some practical questions about your time when you were were facing this challenge mm -hmm. this, this horrible tragedy in your family um so were you were you working when this was happening the whole time were you looking for any other jobs that might have some of these Cadillac plans as Chairman Reapy was saying were available at different places? Unfortunately, most healthcare facilities cannot afford to offer that, um, is what I've been told. Um, so yes, I was definitely looking. Um, I'm a perinatal quality nurse. I am a labor and delivery nurse by trade. It's very, very uh, uh, specific. Uh, and to be able to get my position back I would have never been able to get it back. Um, so continue to grow my career as a, as a woman. Um, and because I have such a, a strong passion for women and, and children's health, um, it was almost impossible for me to find another position. Uh, Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Senator Hunt. Are there other questions from the committee? Thank you very much. Thank you. Are there additional proponents that would like to speak? Can we? Thank you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Welcome. Hello. My name is Lisa O'Connell. It's L I S A. 
O C O N N E L L. And my um I'm a mother of three boys, 24, 25, 27. They all have intellectual disabilities, autism, and along with the multiple hereditary osteochondroma, which is a hereditary condition which consists of bony growths throughout your whole body. Um, and the condition consists of pain, numbness, tingling, tired all the time, and a lot of more issues. And there's always constant back and forth to doctors and specialists and you name it. Um, and so I believe truly that this is a good bill that should get passed. Because so it could support people that always have to miss work because their kid has to go to a doctor's appointment, uh, therapy, you know, all these other different appointments. And so um, I would like the families in to be able to get this kind of bill so we can have people get paid that can still care for their children and care and other people like I have a caregiver now because I need one, you know. Um, he just doesn't, he's old enough to be retired, but if somebody else is doing this job and not working at their regular job, they need to be compensated and helped out. And um, I would like to see that maybe this could be like a stipend paid to these families so it doesn't get in with their income so they lose other benefits that they may not be on SNAP or something. So let's do everything to see the bill pass so we can all have a good life in Nebraska. Thank you very much. Thank you for You're the welcome. time you put forward. Are there questions from the committee? Seeing none. Okay. Thank you very much. Thanks. Are there additional proponents that uh, want to come forward? Okay, let's see. You'd be kind enough to state your name, spell it, and please show us who you represent. Good morning. My name is Tiffany Ewer, T I F F A N Y U H E R, and I'm the executive director of Milkworks. I'm here today to testify in support of LB 57 and to specifically address the impact of family leave policies on the physical health of moms and babies in our community. Milkworks is a nonprofit community breastfeeding center that has served families throughout the state of Nebraska for 22 years. The mission of our organization is to create a healthier community by empowering families to meet their breastfeeding goals. Milkworks provides individual clinical lactation support from board certified professionals in person in Lincoln and in Omaha and via telehealth to the rest of Nebraska. We also provide informal resources like support groups, classes, and online education. In 2022, Milkworks served more than 7,200 families. <clears throat> These families seek support from our team because breastfeeding does not come easily to many mothers. We commonly help babies who struggle, struggle to establish an effective latch or mothers whose milk supply has decreased. These issues are common and with support and time, many mothers are able to overcome most issues. But one of the most important factors in the equation of success is time. And cutting that time short undoubtedly changes the trajectory of each mother and baby's experience. Medical research overwhelmingly confirms the benefits of breastfeeding for both moms and babies. The longer they breastfeed, the greater the benefits for both. Yet our culture throws barriers in their path. One of the biggest barriers is having to return to work and returning to work too soon. Every day, our staff talk to mothers who are worried about transitioning back to work after the birth of their child. Mothers who wish to continue breastfeeding after returning to work need access to a breast pump that works for them in order to maintain their milk production. But even with an effective pump, many mothers have trouble releasing milk when they are feeling stressed, and as a result, their milk production decreases over time. Another very common problem is that babies often decide that they prefer the fast and steady flow of a bottle that they receive at daycare. This can lead to breastfeeding refusal, which is obviously very distressing to working mothers. We know the health benefits of breastfeeding. The American Academy of Pediatrics recently revised their statement on breastfeeding to recommend that babies breastfeed for at least two years, and then as long as mutually desired. The Surgeon General has published a call to action to increase breastfeeding rates as a major public health issue, yet the burden falls almost entirely on mothers and without societal support. By adopting a policy that offers statewide family leave, 
our state would be providing mothers the time they need to better establish and maintain breastfeeding relationships. Nebraska would be, would be making an investment in our mothers, our children, and our future. Thank you. Answer any questions. Thank you very much. Under questions from the committee. Yeah. Senator. Oh, Senator Blood, I didn't want to see your hand. Thank you, Chairman Rigby. I just have a quick question for you. What would you say um, to the people that say, well, she can go back to work because she can pump? Yeah, pumping is very difficult. Pumping also um, takes time. A lot of moms can't pump. And ultimately, um, breastfeeding directly is going to help milk supply. And so um, that that isn't the, the case for most mothers and most working mothers. Um, I was lucky. I was able to pump in an office by myself while I checked emails. I'm not a nurse. I'm not a teacher. I'm not a nail tech. Um, so there are a lot of jobs that mothers hold that they're not able to do that. Or find sanitary areas. To Correct. Them. Yeah. Thank you. You bet. Okay. Are there additional questions? For you? Seeing none, thank you very much for thank being here. Thank you. Our next proponent. We've seen you, so you know the good rules. I do. Thank you, Chair Reapy and members of the Business and Labor Committee. My name is Gina Ragland. That's J I N A R A G L A N D. I'm here today testifying on behalf of ARP Nebraska in support of LB 57. The issue of family caregiving is both timeless and nonpartisan. Most of us are, have been, will be a family caregiver, or will ourselves be needing the help of a loved one to live independently in our lifetime. Family caregivers are the backbone of Nebraska's long-term supports and services system. Nearly 240,000 Nebraskans provide 199 million hours of unpaid care that's valued at $2.9 billion annually and growing. Family caregivers are the first line of assistance for most people, helping to make it possible for older adults and people with disabilities to remain at home and out of higher levels of care settings. These caregivers are the most important source of emotional and practical support for older persons or adults with a serious illness or disability. As the population ages and individuals stay in the workforce longer, trends suggest that an increasing share of family caregivers will be in the labor force. This means that many face the dual demands of employment and caregiving responsibilities for family or friends with serious illness or disability. According to a December 2020 ARP PPI study report, 61% of family caregivers of adult relatives or friends worked at a paying job at some point during their caregiving experience in 2019, making for an estimated 29.2 million employed caregivers of adults. This represents an increase of more than 5 million family caregivers since 2015. Unlike previous generations, many families today do not have a non-working family member to provide daily care to an older relative with self-care needs, in large part because of the increase in the labor force participation rate of women, and especially older women. 73% of millennial family caregivers are employed while also providing care for an adult with a disability or an older adult with chronic care needs. Family caregiving responsibilities impact people across their working lives, often creating a stressful juggling act between work their caregiving role, and other family responsibilities. When work requirements conflict with family obligations, some employed family caregivers must make difficult decisions that can lead to lost wages and missed career opportunities. Many workers struggling to make ends meet, living from paycheck to paycheck, simply cannot afford to take unpaid leave. Workers with elder care responsibilities generally experience increased challenges. Elder care can be especially challenging as often both its onset and duration are unpredictable. And when an older person becomes ill, roles, relationships, and expectations within the family change. Evidence does suggest that more family caregivers are assisting older family members or friends with higher rates of disability than in the past are more likely to be providing hands-on and often physically demanding and intimate personal help. Nearly half of employed caregivers report their relative or friend has two or more conditions that affect the individual's health or functioning. Elder care may arise gradually from chronic degenerative conditions such as multiple sclerosis, Parkinson's disease, or Alzheimer's disease. But very often, the need for caregiving arises abruptly as the result of an accident or acute health crisis, such as a broken hip or a stroke. Suddenly, an adult child is thrown into the world of caregiving with little preparation or time to make choices. Research shows that family caregivers who disrupt their careers or leave the workforce entirely to meet full-time caregiving demands can face substantial economic risk 
and short-term and long-term financial consequences by losing salary, personal retirement savings, and eventual social security and retirement benefits, career opportunities, and overall financial well-being. More than four in 10 employed caregivers have experienced at least one financial setback as a result of caregiving. And about 28% used up their personal short-term savings while 25% took on more debt. Income and benefit losses borne by family caregivers age 50 and older who leave the workforce to care for a parent are nearly $304,000 over that caregiver's lifetime. Other research has also shown a link between family caregiving and the financial strain of lower income later in life. Many caregivers must use up their retirement savings to support their everyday needs and to help pay caregiving expenses, often resulting in lowered future economic security. We are facing a caregiving crisis in the United States and specifically in Nebraska. As both with the workforce and the Nebraska population age, the workforce will include more employers, or excuse me, employees who need to combine elder care responsibilities with their jobs upon which their economic futures depend. Without LB57 and strong paid leave and flexible workplace policies to support family caregivers, vulnerable seniors could be forced to move to higher levels of care with increased costs to themselves, their families, and the state in providing that care. Thank you to Senator Kavanaugh for introducing the legislation and for her ongoing efforts to support Nebraska caregivers. I'd also like to thank the, the caregivers themselves that did um, testify it up as well, and we would ask you for support for the bill. Thank you very much. Other questions from the committee? Seeing none, thank you very much. Additional proponents? Welcome. Hi. If you'd be kind enough to state your name and spell it, and okay. then who you represent, please. Cool. Hello, Senator Rupi and members of the Business and Labor Committee. My name is Naomi Thompson. That's N-Y-O-M-I-T-H-O-M-P-S-O-N. And I'm representing Ivy Black Girl. Ivy Black Girl serves as a reproductive justice organization that centers Black women, femmes, and girls. Because when we do, that benefits everyone. I'm testifying in support of LB57 because it preserves families without threatening their short and long-term economic stability. Due to the already existing health disparities, such as access to healthcare and implicit bias, black people are more likely to live with a chronic illness compared to white people. This results in the need of a, take, a caretaker, and this responsibility has been proven to fall disproportionately on the women of the family. Many women, particularly single mothers and women of color, cannot afford to leave the workforce to address their caregiving needs because their economic contributions are far too important to their family stability. In addition to the vast majority of Black women being head of household, Black women are supporting their families in Nebraska with, on average, $27,500 annually. Child care alone accounts for 30% of the average income for Black women, already leaving very little resources for housing, food, healthcare, and other necessities to meet the needs of their family. Research shows an employee misses around 30 days of work per year to care for a loved one with a chronic illness. That's over $4,000 lost in wages, an amount of money that would put a family into deep poverty where no one's needs, no one's needs can be met. The lack of this benefit also has an impact on family well-being, such as mine. My mom, an immigrant from Trinidad and Tobago, got a job as a public school teacher. My uncle was diagnosed with cancer in late December, and my mom quickly got a plane ticket to Trinidad to take care of her brother. My mom stayed there for a little over a week, but had to come back to the States because she could not afford to lose her wages nor her job. Only five days after she came back to the States, my uncle fell and died from a brain bleed. She wasn't able to say goodbye to her baby brother. I know my mom thinks that she's to blame, but she's not. My mom, just like many other families who do not have access to paid family and medical leave, lack the social supports to have any control of the quality of life or health outcomes faced by a family member suffering from an illness. Paid family leave assists in combating the systemic racism black and brown folks face in the workforce, healthcare, and health outcomes. 
all individuals deserve to keep their families together without sacrificing the economic security required to do so. Please consider moving LB 57 forward and thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you for testifying. Uh, do members of the center. Huh? Thank you, Chairman Reapy. Thank you, Naomi, for coming and for sharing that part of your life experience as well. I have a question for you, but before I ask that, I I was listening to you and thinking about how much in this culture we, because it's really like economic strength over everything else, when we have to make policy, it's, you know, we can pass policies that help humanity, that help keep families together, that help parents raise their children if it's economically beneficial to the bottom line, if it increases productivity and increases the GDP, something like this. And so what you said about your mom made me think about how much we blame ourselves in this culture for the illness of our family members and our loved ones and not getting to say goodbye to somebody we care about, not getting to spend enough time with a dying child for the sake of the bottom line of the GDP or whatever it is lawmakers think is more important than that, when we can afford policies like this. So you may speak to that if you want to, but the question I want to ask you is, um, I'm looking at this report from the National Women's Law Center, which is based in DC, and anybody can pull this up. It's at nwlc.org, and it's a national organization. And this report is from this month, and it says that women are gaining jobs month over month over month, but women still haven't made up the difference in the jobs that we lost in 2020 with the pandemic. And if all of the women who left the labor force in the pandemic were counted among the unemployed, women's unemployment would be over 5%, which is one of the highest, you know, it's the highest demographic of unemployment. But of course we know that this metric masks and hides the actual unemployment rate of black and brown women. And I was wondering if you could speak to that, just the disparate impact. Yeah, um, I feel like people don't really take into account how the social determinants of health um, impact the lack of opportunity to for black women to even be in the labor force. Um, I think that, I don't know, Policies like this um, to provide economic just help in general. There's, you know, like I mentioned, because of like disparities and chronic illness and stuff like that. Like, that's why policies like this need to be in place because we can't like move forward as a society if we're leaving people behind. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And it's it's one thing to think that and you know, have a philosophical belief for something, but when the numbers bear out that through data and through, you know, actual measurable things that we can see in our economy and in our well-being of our neighbors, that's a different thing. Thank you, Naomi. Are there any questions from committee members? Thank you very much for testifying. Appreciate it. Additional proponents? Hello again. Chairman Reapy, members of the Business and Labor Committee. Once again, my name is Erin Feichtinger, E R I N F E I C H T I N G E R. The Women's Fund of Omaha offers its support of LB57 and thanks Senator Kavanaugh for continuing to fight for this, um, for this really important legislation. We support LB57 to create a paid family and medical leave insurance program because more than four out of five workers do not have access to pay leave, to be there during a dying parent's last days, to care for a newborn child during those fragile first weeks, um, or to even care for oneself during an unexpected illness because of the lack of leave. Paid leave allows women to remain in the workforce, supports their economic stability, and reduces the gender wage gap. No one should have to choose between their job, their ability to provide for their families financially, and the need to be there for the most important moments in their families' lives. But currently, paid leave is a luxury benefit accessible only to some, a Cadillac plan, as you said, Senator Reapy. 
Nationally, only 17% of workers have access to paid family leave, and those who need paid leave the most, low-income workers, have the lowest level of access to such benefits. Of the lowest 10% of wage earners, only 5% have access to paid family leave. But every child and every sick family member deserves to be cared for when they need it. In Nebraska, women represent almost half of the full-time workers in the state, and the great majority of children in our state have working mothers at almost 80%. Women are asked to balance caregiving and work, which, as most women would tell you, is made incredibly difficult without access to leave when they need it. COVID provided a stark example um, of this challenging balance. The workforce lost 1.8 million women from uh, February 2020 to early 2022 across the country. We hear constantly from the Nebraska legislature that you want to encourage Nebraskans to work that you want to decrease reliance on public assistance programs, that we want to attract young people here to start their families and grow Nebraska like me and my husband did. This committee and the entire state will have to figure out how to address the shortage of care and services for both our aging population and people with disabilities. And providing for um, family medical leave goes a long way to addressing those issues. Women are more likely to return to work if they have paid leave Women with paid leave have a 39% lower likelihood of receiving public assistance and a 40% lower likelihood of needing SNAP. It addresses the motherhood penalty where women experience a 7% decrease in pay for each child they have. And women who return to work after paid leave are more likely to stay employed years later, um, benefiting their families and their employers and Nebraska's economy. We are not insensitive to the new cost to employees, or employers, excuse me, who do not currently provide any leave. But it is our hope that employers, as much as employees, want to put families first. And LB 57 provides them with the tool to do that. We at the Women's Fund believe that family and medical leave is a critical policy solution that will help provide long-term economic stability to women and their families. And uh, we welcome your support of this important legislation as well. And I'm happy to answer any questions to the best of my ability. Thank you for your presentation. Other questions? Senator Hunt. Thank you, Chairman Repeat. Welcome, Dr. Feistinger. Um, I have a question about the structure of this bill. I think that sometimes proponents here paid family leave, they think, okay, big government, you know, subsidies, more people, you know, taking advantage of taxpayers, wasting money, this and that personal responsibility, yada, yada. What I like about this bill that makes it different to me, similar to how we were talking about Senator McKinney's bill earlier, is it allows ways for employers to opt out and it creates an insurance program instead of just requiring small business owners like me, the government comes down and says, okay, surprise, Megan, now you have to invent a paid family leave policy and pay for all of that. And as a small business owner, this might be the only way that these employers can offer benefits to their employees because it's an insurance pool basically that larger employers can then opt out of. Can you, is that, is my impression right? Is that your? Yeah, and I, you know, this, obviously this bill has been brought several times and over the course of- in different of, forms. Right, so. and exactly, that's the point is that, um, you know, like any good legislation, um, this bill has been worked through several iterations to come, I think, to that balance that you're talking about, um, that this isn't a government mandate. This is a recognition of um, the way that Nebraska needs this policy to work, that employers need this policy to work, um, and as well as looking forward to the future in addressing all of those issues that this committee is likely going to have to deal with of a workforce um, shortage of attracting young people here, of making sure that um, folks can get taken care of when they need it. So, And I'll, I'll ask you the same question I asked Naomi from Ivy Black Girl about how we see that women have gained jobs month over month over month since the pandemic began, but we still haven't caught up to the rate of employment women were at before the pandemic. Mm -hmm. And what relationship you think that has to potentially paid family leave, not necessarily on the national level, but definitely on the state level? I mean, you're, so the 
at the beginning of COVID and up to February 2022, um, like I said, the, the country lost 1.8 million women out of the workforce. And you're correct that while women have at this point, um, just at the very end of 2022 and the beginning of 2023, finally regained those lost jobs, we are not gaining them at the same rate um, that men in the workforce are. And I think that that goes back to that balance um, in our society right now of needing to, that women are, are primarily asked to be the caregivers. So even though we may be past the more emergency state of the pandemic, um, I know just personally from my experience, if, if my I got an email this morning from my daughter's school that there was a case of COVID in her classroom. Um, and what that means if if she gets it, it's going to be me, you know, that has to take that time. I'm very fortunate that I have a job that allows me to do that. Um, and I'm very happy to be able to do both of those things. And um, my experience as a, as a working mother is not universal across the state in any, I mean, very much an anomaly, um, the flexibility that I yeah. have. And those numbers are not even including women who have left the workforce. Yeah. Which many thousands and tens of thousands of women have. They've just stopped looking. Um, I also want to ask you, this is a little bit of left field, but I was thinking about this too. I mentioned on a different bill, or maybe it was when I was talking to Senator Kavanaugh, that I was speaking at a conference last year to a colleague to lots of different colleagues all over the country, but one of my best legislative friends in the you know, pantheon of lawmakers around the country at the state level is a state representative in Colorado. And she and I were talking about how in Colorado, they passed a couple years ago, a ballot initiative creating a paid family leave policy at the mm -hmm. state level. And the support for the initiative was really high across the state, but it was actually highest in Republican El Paso County, in several rural parts of the state, and all over the state, it seemed like Coloradans understood the benefits of this because, of course, you know, needing to work and needing to care for your family knows no party. And I was wondering if you could speak to that. Policies like this and a lot of other issues um, that we work on, I think this goes back to your um, what you were talking with Ms. Thompson about. Um, I don't know that there's anyone, uh, you know, I'd say the overwhelming majority of people in this state are familiar with the stress or the um, anxiety or the regret or the fear that comes with not being able to be there in a critical moment, um, you know, not being able to be there when your mom's in the hospital or not, not getting to spend as much time with your newborn, you know, your beautiful baby who you love and just want to stare at and listen to, um, and not being able to spend that time. I so I get I think that I think that this kind of policy I think speaks to that inherent compassion that people have for each other and for their own I don't know if that answers your question. I well, got a little bit of Well, my <laughs> thought in terms of economic development and growth and workforce development yeah. that is the top priority of the Chamber of Commerce, it's the top mm -hmm. priority of many senators sitting here to hear them tell it. Um, trying to get workforce in rural Nebraska, whether that's healthcare, when we're facing an abortion ban, um, you know, trying to get OBGYNs out in rural Nebraska who may not even be able to practice in this state once they move out here. Um, trying to get people to work at these businesses, you know, Senator Kavanaugh saying the mayor of um, Valentine, we thought, but I don't remember which town, saying they had more businesses than they had workers, more jobs than they had workers. And just the way this would benefit rural Nebraska as, as much as anywhere else is a point I don't think should be left unsaid. Thank you. Thank you very much. Are there other questions from the committee? Hearing none, thank you very much. Additional proponents? If you...
additional people that intend to testify, if they would please come forward sit to the front row so that we can move along. Thank you. Uh, if you'd, thank you for coming in. Would you state your name and spell it in? Yeah. Your organization that you're with, and then please proceed. Okay. Thank you, um, Chairperson Reby and members of the Business and Labor Committee. My name is Anae Salazar, um, A-N-A-H-I-S-A-L-A-Z-A-R, and I am representing Voices for Children in Nebraska in support of LB57. Nebraskans are hardworking and committed to building better futures for themselves and their families. We also have a strong value of caregiving taking care of our children and taking care of our loved ones as they age. It is important to consider the relationship between caregiving and workforce participation in order to ensure that during life's most treasured, stressful, and or critical moments, Nebraskans have, don't have to choose between family and secure employment. Paid leave helps families build secure relationships with their babies that are so important to children's long-term learning and success. Allowing birthing parents to stay home can have a significant impact on Nebraska's infant mortality rate, which increased from, two, from 2019 to 5.6 per 1,000 births in 2020. Since the enactment of paid leave policies in other states, there is ample evidence that paid family leave contributes to lower rates of infant mortality and decreases neo, postneonatal mortality. Paid leave allows parents to stay home and care for their child, which is imperative for both the baby and the birthing person's health and well-being. Adequate time off after birth also results in longer periods of breastfeeding. The benefits also accrue for children who join families through foster care or adoption. Paid leave ensures families have time to care for new children and seam seamlessly integrate them into family without sacrificing long-term economic stability. Children and families who most need paid leave are unable to access it. Currently, families across Nebraska have difficulty have difficult decisions to make. Do they take care of their newborns, their new children, sick children, ill family members, even themselves, or do they go back to work because they need the money for their basic or medical needs? Only about 40% of families in Nebraska can afford to take unpaid leave under the Family and Medical Leave Act, FMLA. Access to leave is highly determined by income and those in the lowest wage jobs do not have the financial capacity to take the needed time off. From work. The estimated share of quarterly income, family income, lost for a full year of working after taking 12 weeks of FMLA can greatly impact Nebraska families. In Nebraska, women were estimated to lose 14% of their quarterly wage after taking partially paid leave and almost 50% um, of wage loss after taking unpaid leave. Investing in families is an investment in Nebraska's workforce. The increase in single parent households has resulted in a rise in child care needs while a rapidly aging um, Population creates medical and caregiving needs. Employee turnover, the loss of institutional knowledge, absenteeism and presenteeism, and temporary hiring are all already affecting businesses' bottom line. A recent survey found that one in three workers have left at least one job due to caregiving responsibilities, and the most experienced and highest paid workers were most likely to be affected. Paid family leave policies do not adversely impact business productivity or profitability. Recent studies have shown that paid leave saves employees from needing to hire replacements and reducing turnover costs. In fact, improving job continuity. Family values are at the heart of Nebraska values. LB57 would, would ensure that all Nebraskans can be there for the most important moments in our families' lives and that our children can have the best start to life. Thank you, Senator Michaela Kavanaugh, for your leadership in bringing this important issue forward. And we respectfully urge the committee to advance LB57. Um, I'm available to answer any questions. Thank you very much for your presentation. Are there questions from the committee? Seeing none, thank you very much. Thank you. Next open comment, please. I'm back. You are. Hello, uh, my name is Edison McDonald, E D I S O N M C D O N A L D, representing the Ark of Nebraska. We advocate for people with intellectual and developmental disabilities and their families. We focus on community inclusion because it results in the best treatment outcomes that are the most cost effective and therefore we strongly support LB57 because it will help our members and their families. Testified on this bill today and as I was preparing today I was thinking what's different than the previous times that I've testified on this. We are in such a state of emergency. Our Medicaid long-term supports and services are crashing. Our special education system is crashing. And family caregivers are the ones trying to pick up the pieces and hold it together 
with every last bit that they can. We have 1.9% unemployment in the state, 30% shorting staffage in, de in developmental disability services. So even if you theoretically have staff, a lot of times you may not get care and you may have the situation that so many of our members have had where they expect to have some sort of staffing or support and then comes to the day and the DSP never shows up. I'm seeing this stress really affects family caregivers at a whole new level. Uh, the amount of behavioral health issues in caregivers is increasing. Uh, and I was thinking about it the other day. I've seen so many of especially our male caregivers who are having more heart issues that are clearly stress related that are impacting them. We have to do something to help support our family caregivers and help to keep the system from breaking. They don't need everything. They don't want everything. They, they just need enough to help keep their head above water. This is an important step to help make sure that they have at least some sort of help, some sort of ability to be able to address uh, the issues that are facing them and to care for their loved ones. So thank you for your time and uh, any questions. Any members of the committee have a question? Thank you very much. Next, Pearl Good afternoon. Nick Faustman with uh, NICK FAUSTMAN with the Alzheimer's Association, Nebraska chapter. Uh, we had a volunteer who's very passionate about this uh, topic lined up to appear this morning uh, before the committee. However, she fell ill over the weekend, and so I'm here to provide a bit of a summary of some of the um, points that she wanted to make sure to pass along to the committee. Um, so I'll be very brief. Uh, in 2022, 61,000 Nebraskans provided more than $9 million, $905 million of uncompensated care to 35,000 people over the age of 65 who are living with Alzheimer's. According to the, to the uh, Alzheimer's Association's 2020 Alzheimer's disease facts and figures, 57% of caregivers reported sometimes needing to go in late to work or leave early in order to provide care for a loved one living with the disease. And 18% of dementia caregivers reduced their work hours due to care responsibilities. And that's somewhat very, or somewhat uh, similar to what Emily's situation was. Her dad was diagnosed with Alzheimer's at the age of 62 and passed away at the age of 66. During those four years, she missed countless hours of work to be a caregiver for her father. Alzheimer's is an unpredictable disease, and so there is no warning a lot of the time of, of when she would need to be off work to care for her father. She uh, would need to leave work for doctor's appointments, overall general care, at times to calm him down, uh, to be there for him in times where he was displaying behaviors and in, in, in situations in which the facility uh, at which he was living, they would not be able to handle uh, some of those behaviors. Um, there were numerous times where she considered dropping her hours to part time. However, from a financial standpoint, that just wasn't an option for her and her family. Um, she strongly feels that paid family medical leave would have helped alleviate some, not all the stress um, and financial burden that she endured while, while caring for her father. Um, and with that, uh, that's, that's where I'll close. Uh, we urge the uh, Business and Labor Committee to advance the bill to general file. Thank you for being here. Are there uh, questions from the committee? Seeing none, thank, thank you very you. much. Additional proponents. <clears throat> Good morning, Chairman Reapy and members of the Business and Labor Committee. My name is Diane Amdor, D-I-A-N-E-A-M-D-O-R, and I'm the staff attorney for the Economic Justice Program at Nebraska Appleseed. Nebraska Appleseed is a nonprofit law and policy organization that works for justice and opportunity for all Nebraskans. Thank you for the opportunity to testify in support of LB57, and thank you to Senator Kavanaugh for her leadership on this issue. Roads, running water, and electricity are basic forms of infrastructure. 
that are necessary for people to be productive in our economy and to be engaged in our society. Similarly, having a child, recovering from a serious illness, and caring for an elder are normal life events that must be supported over the full course of our lives so that current and future generations can be productive in our economy and engaged in our society. But simply, as I think several people have made this point already today, if we want people to live and work in Nebraska, if we want people to move here, if we want people to stay here, we need to invest in both the physical and social infrastructure that can support the people and businesses of our state. You've heard several heartbreaking and I would say infuriating stories today from individuals who've been directly impacted by our state's lack of social infrastructure. And I hope that you'll each go and seek out more of these stories from each of your districts because every family has these stories. On top of the practical challenges of needing to navigate a major life event while also maintaining employment and paying the bills, there's this emotional challenge that's more difficult to quantify. I remember what it felt like when I had my child in 2019 and I was working for a small organization at the time that didn't offer any paid leave. I felt angry and I felt sad writing this testimony to prepare for today, I feel those emotions again. Scrolling through and reading about other countries where you get 12 weeks, 40 weeks, up to a year and a half of paid leave. And I was able to take 12 weeks of paid leave. But I just, I'm so angry, honestly, that my family had to do that without the social support of society. With minimal, I would say, not none, because milk works exists. But um, that's not society, I guess. They're their own organization. Um, but I just, I think it's infuriating that so many other new parents, especially, who are not maybe able to take that time that I was able to take. I'm a white person from an upper middle class background, upbringing. I have a professional education. I don't say, oh, I did it so other people can figure it out on their own. I say I did it, but I know that not everyone would be able to do what I was able to do. But other parents need and deserve that time off just as much as I did. I think there's a moral imperative to invest in social infrastructure. It is the right thing to do. If that were enough to pass this bill, we wouldn't have had to testify on an issue like this multiple times in the last decade. But also on top of that moral imperative, there's an economic imperative to invest in social infrastructure, just like there's an economic imperative to invest in physical infrastructure. I read about a bill this session that would provide funding to pave all of the gravel highways in this state. And I got to thinking about it and just imagine what would it be like if we had unpaved stretches of major highways in our state, roads that hundreds of thousands of Nebraskans drove on every single day, if they weren't paved. That would be a massive failure in our state's physical infrastructure. It would be unacceptable and it would be remedied probably no matter the cost. Our lack of a paid family leave policy is that equivalent level of a failure in our state's social infrastructure. On the federal level, the, paid, the Family and Medical Leave Act, FMLA, provides a minimal level of that social infrastructure and has prevented millions of people from being fired for taking time to care for their families or themselves. They have one minute. Thank you. You've heard about the limitations of that policy already today, so I won't go into it. LB 57 would provide social infrastructure to support families with newborn children, to support workers who need to care for themselves or for their parents. And in addition, would provide social infrastructure to support businesses by reducing worker replacement costs. And it, many businesses want to do this, that would help them. It would provide the social infrastructure to those businesses to be able to support their workers. Um, there's more detail in my written testimony about each of those points, and I think they've been made by others here today. And I'm out of time, so I'm not going to go into them. We appreciate your attention to this issue, and we encourage the committee to advance LB 57. Thank you very much for being here. Are there questions from the committee? Senator Hunt. Thank you, Chairman Reepke. Um, as the staff attorney for the Economic Justice Program, can you speak to the impact this could have on rural Nebraska? Um, on rural Nebraska specifically, I, I think it's been stated by others as well. It's an infrastructure if, issue. If you think about the support that is necessary to meet people's needs, that support is not currently present, and this bill would help to, to provide that. Um, I think it's 
kind of like with the roads. Maybe it's overlooked by people who don't drive on those roads every day, but the need is there for the people who are driving on those roads. And it's up to society to provide the kind of infrastructure that people need in those areas. Thank you. Yes. Okay, any more questions from the committee? Seeing none, thank you very much for being here. Thank Additional you. pro comments? <clears throat> Hi, uh, my name is Scout Richters, S-C-O-U-T-R-I-C-H-T-E-R-S -E here on, again on behalf of the ACLU of Nebraska in support of LB57. Um, I first want to thank Senator Kavanaugh for champ championing this issue and all the bill's co-sponsors for, for supporting this bill. Um, the vast majority of people in Nebraska lack paid family leave. Um, we know that in Nebraska, even unpaid leave under the Federal Family and Medical Leave Act is inaccessible for approximately 62% of working people. Um, and even when it is available, obviously, many people can't afford to take that unpaid leave. Um, what that means is that when health issues inevitably arise, it can force people to make an impossible choice between caring for themselves and their families or keeping a job. Um, this choice between caring for themselves or their families or keeping a job disproportionately um, affects low-wage workers who most often um, lack paid leave. Um, these low-wage jobs, as you heard, are disp disproportionately held by women, specifically women of color. Um, and then compounding this fact is that caregiving work, although obviously essential to society, tends to be undervalued and is often unpaid or underpaid. So establishing a paid family and medical leave program in Nebraska recognizes the, the reality um, that at some point almost all employees must must take time off to work um, to oh, sorry um, time off of work sorry to handle a personal or family member illness or to take care of a new child. Establishing a paid family leave program is particularly important in Nebraska as. Um, Nebraska consistently has extremely high rates of women, uh, women's workforce participation consistently ranking in the top 10 of all states. In short, we know that many Nebraskans work and care for their family. Um, we, again, as you've heard, know that the population in Nebraska is aging, which obviously increases the need for care. We know that, that choices between jobs and, and family hurt the economy by forcing people, um, again, more likely women, out of the labor market. Paid leave means a stronger economy and, and fairness for all workers, regardless of gender or race. And, and we really urge the committee to advance this vital legislation. Thank you for being here. Are there questions from the committee? Seeing none. Thank you. Thank you. Additional proponents. Good afternoon, Chair Reapy and the members of the Business and Labor Committee. My name is Susan Martin, S-U-S-A-N-M-A-R-T-I-N, testifying on behalf of the Nebraska State AFL-CIO and all working families in the state of Nebraska in support of LB57. The United States is the only industrialized nation that fails to provide paid family leave for new parents or to care for a seriously ill family member. The only federal right that some private sector workers have is to unpaid family and medical leave provided under the Family and Medical Leave Act. The United States is an outlier when it comes to providing paid family leave. There's no federal law that requires employers to prov provide paid time for working people experiencing a short-term illness. As of June 2022, there are 11 states um, that have enacted paid leave laws to allow working people to address their own or a family member's illnesses. In all other parts of the country, working people who are fortunate enough to be represented by unions can rely on their unions to negotiate these benefits on their behalf. Access to paid leave is higher in unionized workplaces than in non-unionized workplaces. 
Working people who are not represented by a union can only hope that their employers provide paid leave benefits voluntarily. Because there is no federal requirement, few states have passed their own laws. Very few working people have access to paid family and medical leave. The Bureau of Labor Statistics show that only about one in four employees, 24% in the private sector workforce has access to paid family leave. America's working people rely on the very limited protections provided under the FMLA uh, and since 1993, it's estimated that the FMLA has been used more than 20, 200 million times by America's working people. Unfortunately, the FMLA only partially addresses workers' needs. The effectiveness of the FMLA is constrained by its limit, limited coverage and the inability of millions of workers to afford leave without pay. According to the Department of Labor estimates, approximately 44% of the workforce is not eligible for FMLA benefits due to our requirements or worksite size, but 56% 56, but 56 are eligible. 45% of working people who needed to take FMLA covered leave but did not take it said they could not afford to take leave. Employees who earn less than $35,000 annually workers of color and unmarried workers were more likely than other employees to need leave that they did not take. New mothers who take paid leave are more likely to be working and to earn higher wages in the year after their child's birth. Both new mothers and new fathers who take paid leave are less likely to rely on public assistance or food stamps in the year after their child's birth. Instead of taking paid leave to care for elderly parents, they lose an average of more than three. Oh, um, when working people ages 50 or older must leave the workforce, instead of taking paid leave to care for an elder, elderly parent, they lose an average of more than $300,000 in earnings and retirement savings. We again want to thank Senator Kavanaugh for introducing this important, much needed legislation. By passing LB 57, we are valuing our workers and allowing Nebraska businesses to attract and retain a productive workforce. We ask that you support LB 57 and advance it from committee for consideration by the full legislature. Does the committee have uh, questions? Senator Hunt, please. Thank you, Chairman Reed P. Thank you, Ms. Martin, for being here today on sure. the different bills that we're discussing. Um, can you speak from even anecdotal experience or anything about Nebraska's competitiveness on the national level compared to other states and the benefits that you see workers getting in other states that do have paid leave? Um, only, only I can only speak to the unionized employees. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, that's who so I mean. when yeah, so um, uh, other states, of course, like especially in the eleven states that pass paid family leave laws, um, they, I guess, why not? <laughs> yeah, so I don't know. Okay. Yeah. Okay, thank you. I do want to add, can I add a comment though yeah. with, you were talking about um, earlier about rural Nebraska yeah. and businesses, so. Yeah, I'm eager um, to hear views about this. Yeah, yeah so, um, you know, COVID provided, uh, we all know a workforce shortage. We have a workforce shortage. And so a lot of employers are not coming back into the workforce because of that work-life balance. And so that's why I guess I, I, I think you're going to attract more workers if you have some type of paid family leave. And so I think that's why this bill is so important. I think it's very daunting and frustrating as a small business owner to think about government mandating another benefit that I have to provide. And What I appreciate about the way this bill has been crafted over the years, I mean, it was introduced before Senator Kavanaugh was elected. People have been working on this, of course. Um, I think it makes it very easy and it, it, it makes it possible for employers, small employers to provide a benefit that they do want to provide, but they don't have the capacity to figure out all on their own. Um, and that is one thing I think would help Nebraska rural workforce. Right. And I agree with that. I think uh, um, it's not, it's an option. And 
employers are good at heart. Mm -hmm. They want to treat their employees yeah. good and they want to value their employees. And so I think this is a good way to help with that, help assist them to help with that. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Just any other questions? I have a question. Let me send a pencil, please. Thank you. Uh, you were listing out some statistics. I was trying to, I was trying to find it. Like, uh, I Bureau found labor about, statistics is where I got the information. Okay. Yeah. Do National. you know on average the when a company does offer paid family leave? I don't have that number. I can find it for you though. Yeah. When they do offer paid family leave, maybe you can find too what the average length of paid family leave they give. Okay. Sure. I'm just kind of curious, like how that is comparison to this bill. Absolutely. So I'll look that up. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, I have a question. Now you negotiate contracts, right? I don't know. I represent labor organizations who do. Okay. So the organizations that do represent or do negotiate those contracts, do they ever negotiate in this medical leave as part of their contract as um, opposed to relying on the state to do it? No, that yeah, that's all negotiated in their in their contract negotiations. If they've been leave. unsuccessful in doing it. That's why we're here today. Oh yes. Oh, I'm I'm not actually I'm supportive for working families. Um, so I, I I see which where you're going with this question. Unions are lucky in that they can negotiate those those into their contracts. And so I guess my testimony is more in support of others that don't have that. Okay. Thank you, Chairman Reapy. For so many private employers, not just private, but many employers in Nebraska who don't have unionized staff or workers, this would affect them. Is that your oh, understanding? Absolutely. Yeah. Because unions can negotiate benefits yeah. like this. Yes, correct. But my employees, for example, could if they unionized, but they aren't unionized, and so that's not something that's brought to me as an employer. Correct. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Is there other questions? Hearing none, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Additional proponents. Good afternoon, Chairman Reapy and uh, members of the Business and Labor Committee. Uh, my name is Felicia Hilton, F-E-L-I-C-I-A-H-I-L-T-O-N, and I'm uh, the political director for North Central States Regional Council of Carpenters, and we are in favor of um, LB-57. Uh, but we're in favor of the bill, um, not because this isn't something that, as the uh, Carpenters Union, we can't negotiate um, within our contracts as well, but for the, the broader working uh, public uh, to speak on behalf of, of all workers, um, we think this is a, a good bill and a, a great idea. Um, I think for all of us, whether it's you know the business or it's trades, we're all looking for uh, workers. After the pandemic and the um, uh, worker shortage that we're facing now, is because a number of workers that were um, a little bit older but were uh, not as, uh, you know, at retirement age kind of left the workforce um, and they're not coming back. And then we see a lot of younger workers um, after, I think, the uh, recession, the Great Recession, people saw their, their parents lose their homes and their jobs. And so trying to get younger people interested in benefits and longevity at, a, at the workplace is really not that appealing without these types of expansion of things that would uh, entice younger people to want to commit to uh, a longer term career. So even when we're recruiting apprentices and we're saying, you know, you'll get uh, retirement, you'll get health care, you'll get all these things when they're younger, those things aren't actually um, are actually something that really appeals to them because they can look at um, their career long term. I think a lot of young people, like I said, were scarred by the recession and have a different view of long term work when they saw parents working 25, 30 years, lose their job, lose everything. Their interpretation is, well, how will I benefit or make sure that 
I have some type of protection. Um, if something were to happen, whether it be to a family member, a loved one, um, or themselves. And I think that this helps uh, recruit people into the state to work. I think it helps uh, maintain people, especially younger people that are, are still here. I think it helps uh, retain people so you don't have the brain drain from people coming in for university and then leaving to states that offer benefits like this. So I really just think that it's uh, definitely um, 2023 workforce, work environment, and these are the things that uh, we feel will help uh, recruit people into the state, uh, keep people here that are already working, um, and to kind of show a younger generation of people where these things really matter to them. Um, I know there's a bunch of, from businesses to marketing to everything, people are trying to reach Generation Z and people that really care about it, the community as a whole. And I think bills like this really help with that. So um, for the young people that are coming into the workforce that are you know, somewhat hesitant to commit to a long-term career, um, these are the things that help them do so. Um, and I, I do strongly believe that because we experience that in the trades where um, once we get to talk with them about uh, these long-term benefits, um, if you come in right out of high school, you could possibly retire at 49, you'll have a pension, you'll have health care, your entire family will have health care. We see these trigger young people into thinking about their future because there are a lot of them that are still, like I said, scarred from, from what happened and what they saw their families go through in, in 2007 through 2000 and about 13. So with that, I'll, I'll just close and just say that I think this is a, a great bill to uh, recruit a next generation of workers that wanna come and live and build their lives and family in Nebraska. And I think it'll, it'll benefit the state greatly. Thank you for your testimony. Other questions from the committee? Senator Hanson. Thank you. Your, your testimony made me think of a couple of things. I thought maybe you could answer it for me. I'm assuming, and I missed Senator Kavanaugh's opening, I'm assuming this a covered individual would mean a, a, a man or a woman. Mm -hmm. So just a couple of questions. And so you were just mentioning the difficulty it is to find workers. Yeah, for pretty much everywhere. Yeah. So, so if, say, they had uh, one of your one of the people you represent end up having a child, and they could take twelve weeks off of work, do you think that would hurt your industry? Well, if they were taking uh, twelve weeks off of work, uh, for for us, we have paid maternity leave, um, so you know it impacts us, but we think that. You know, what, what our biggest goal is, is when we recruit women into the trades, we want to make sure that after they have a family that they come back into the trades. It's an investment of four years between the union and our employers into educating someone as an apprentice. Um, and so when we have women that come into the apprenticeship and become uh, mothers, our goal is to make sure they can come back into the trades. And so we even upped our paid maternity leave from the disability of 350 a week to 850 a week, up to 26 weeks for women that are having babies in construction. Obviously, if you get to a position of pregnancy, you might not be able to perform the work. Um, and so our goal is that after they've done this, that they're able to come back to work. And so we see the importance of that. And then when we see something like this, we've had, you know, folks have kids that have had a number of issues. And knowing that um, there's some peace of mind that they're able to have income coming in while they're dealing with such a terrific, you know, horrific uh, issue in their family is also important. But having people come back to work after something like this happens is really important. Um, okay, and it, that helps. I was, this is some of the questions I was asking earlier. I'm try, just trying to figure out comparisons about what, what's already currently done by organizations mm -hmm. versus what the bill's trying to do. So you already offer paid family uh, leave uh, for how many weeks? Up to 26 yeah. weeks. 26 weeks, good, that's what's kind of wonder. I'm kind of trying to compare. But that's our, that's our negotiated yep. bid, yes. So if somebody has a child, they can take 26 weeks yes. off? Okay, and then how does that, so then, with, with your um, industry, how does it work with contract work then? So say like, since a lot of them are probably con you know, independent contractors maybe on jobs. Yeah. Um, so 
they only have maybe like two or three weeks left um, on a job and they take 12 weeks off, do you still like when, when they're not working? So typically they, they're being time with it, maybe weren't working or between jobs, they still get paid with that? You mean if they, if they're, if someone were sick in their family? Yeah, or they had a kid or something. Yeah, yeah or if they had a kid. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it impacts. Um, they still but, get paid, right? Like yeah, they would get, if they were on or off the job. Yeah, they'll okay. still get paid, to, but they'll get the, either the disability or they'll get the maternity leave. Okay. So um, it just depends. But yes, they do. They'll still get paid. Okay, that's good. I was just kind of figuring out the relationship there, how it works with you guys. So thank yeah, you. Yeah, Appreciate it. Thank you, Senator Hanson. Are there other questions? Hearing none, thank you very much. We're still on proponents. Welcome, if you'll state your name, spell it, and then indicate who you're representing, and uh, please go forward. Uh, good afternoon, Chairman Reapy and members of the committee. My name is Thomas Blanton, and I have some good news to share. About three months ago, my wife and I learned that we're going to be first-time parents very soon, and I couldn't be more excited. So I'm here to voice my support for LB57. I believe that everyone should be able to take the time to care uh, for their families, take care of themselves or their families, or spend time with their newborns and not have to worry about stretching their budgets. In our case, my wife and I just happen to be very fortunate compared to many folks after our child is born, my wife will be able to take 12 weeks off and receive four to six weeks of half pay. And I, being an employee of the Federal Civil Service, will be able to take 12 weeks off at full pay, which I consider myself uh, very lucky in that regard. While I'm very grateful that we will be able to spend time with our newborn without enduring financial hardship, a lot of working families in Nebraska are not as fortunate. Uh, many more beginning people have to choose their jobs over, the, over the, their health or the health of their families which just increases future medical costs or they're having to delay starting families until their financial situations are better. Or choosing to not start families altogether because it's just not financially feasible. I believe that the passage of LB57 is important because it will allow more Nebraskans uh, the option to take care of themselves or their families. Uh, I think that it is important that lawmakers try to find ways to address the problems that working families are facing. And I believe LB57 is an excellent proposal that does just that. LB57 would give working families more options and relieve financial stress, and so ask all members of the committee to support LB57 and vote to release it to the floor. I'd like to thank Senator Kavanaugh for introducing the bill and Senator Conrad for co-sponsoring it. Co -sponsoring it. I think it's a very important addition to the conversation of helping working families. Uh, thank you all for your time, and for the record, our baby boy is due July 20th. Congratulations. Thank you. Thanks for the presentation. Other questions from the committee? Thank you, Chairman Reapy. Mazel tov. Congratulations. Thank you. Give your wife our best. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other questions? No. Thank you for testifying. Additional proponents. Those speaking in favor, seeing no more. Any in opposition? Testimony is long, so I'm going to be fast and maybe skip a little. Okay. <laughs> Chairman Reapy and members of the Business and Labor Committee, for the record, my name is Katie Thurber, K A T I E T H U R B E R, General Counsel for the Nebraska Department of Labor. I'm appearing here today on behalf of the department in opposition to LB 57. LB57 is a rework of LB290 in 2021. Our administration continues to try to be innovative and generous when it comes to maternity leave. We support creating a work environment that is more conducive to new parents. However, the coverage provided for in this bill is very broadly drafted, so I'm going to explain the mechanics of it in more detail. Before diving into the benefits proposed in LB57, I want to start by taking a minute to address the fiscal note. I fully understand the cost in an administration is large. The department has always analyzed Rhode Island's experience with the paid family and medical leave. However, Rhode Island has had an existing paid medical leave program known as Temporary Disability Insurance, or TDI. 
This existing program is the overwhelming majority of benefits paid under their program. 92% of benefits paid were paid under the existing TDI program. Nebraska has no similar existing program. The District of Columbia recently launched their paid family and medical leave program. They also had no existing framework for the program. The department believes Nebraska's implementation experience will better compare to DC's experience. For the first three years, DC had estimated administrative costs of 24 million, and that excludes their, um, their um, IT costs. Nebraska has a larger population than DC, so we anticipate more applications and LB57 requires full implementation at a significantly faster pace than DC. The department has no reason to believe it can implement more quickly for more people at lower cost than DC. Significant concerns about the timelines proposed in LB57 also impact the cost. As drafted, no administrative funds are received by the department until October 23. However, the department is required to begin collecting the employer tax by January 2024. That is simply not a feasible timeline for implementation. It will also be extremely difficult to be in a position to make payments by January of 25. DC's legislation was passed in February 2017, and applications for the program did not begin until July 1 of 2020. LB57, if passed, will give the department just over a year to implement the program. DC had over three years. The overwhelming share of the program costs will be the benefits paid. The department is projecting over $300 million per year in benefit costs. Because DC just implemented their program in 2020, data on their program is not overly available. We did find that in approximate, the first year, approximately 12,000 applications were received, and 69% of those were for parental leave, 24 for medical, and seven for family caregiver leave. For benefits paid, the department continued to review Rhode Island as more specific data was available. The Rhode Island 21 annual statistics for its combined TDI and paid family leave program are now available. Those statistics set forth the handout is set forth in the handout with that same title. In 21, Rhode Island received approximately 48,000 applications. About 33,000 initial applications were for TDI leave for serious non-work-related injuries or illnesses exceeding seven days in length. Around 26,000 claims were approved. Rhode Island received only 15,000 initial applications for temporary caregiver insurance, of which 7,000 were approved. In financial terms, Rhode Island paid out an approximate total of $208 million in, in paid leave, temporary disability, and caregiver benefits in 2021, and the benefit amount average was $574 per week. Of that total, approximately $16 million was for caregiver benefits. To estimate benefits paid under LB57, the department closely examined Rhode Island statistics. LB57 only provides benefits for individuals employed in covered employment or self-employed that elect into the program. In 22, Rhode Island had approximately 484,000 workers in covered employment. Based on the 48,000 initial applications received, it was determined approximately 10% of the covered workforce filed a claim for paid leave benefits. Approximately 69% of the claims filed were approved. For that same time, Nebraska had approximately 982,000 workers in covered employment, and 10% filed a claim for paid benefits leave. There would be approximately 98,249 claims for benefits. Of those, 69% would be approved. The average number of payments per claim in Rhode Island was just under 11 payments. Nebraska estimated eight payments for its fiscal note calculation yeah, because of minute. the differences in leave. LB57 proposes a rather complex benefit amount calculation. Section 4 of the bill requires the department to look at wages above and below the average weekly wage. As Senator Kavanaugh explained in her opening, um, the overall cap is 66%, um, but it varies based on where you sit in that wage. Most importantly, LB57 proposes a $543,919,193 tax increase on Nebraska employers. LB57 requires covered employers to contribute to the paid family medical leave insurance fund. Would you be able to kind of... Yep. Um, the, I would just say the maximum amount of contributions the department could have collected during this time under LB57 is $543,919,000. And I provided copies of all of the data that was put on that. Okay, thank you for your hard work. Uh, are there questions? Senator Hunt. Thank you, Chairman Repeat. Ms. Thurber, thank you for coming to our committee. Yes. Have you shared these concerns in advance with Senator Kavanaugh's office? Uh, not extremely timely, but it's the exact same concerns as the last So bill. no? Um, she was aware. Not extremely timely or no? Um, so 
not extremely timely, um, Sunday, Saturday, Sunday, I don't know, one of those days I did email her that we'd be opposing, but a specific conversation on this bill, no, on the last bill, yes. Okay. Just talking about this bill. For the, okay. for the remainder of my questions, they're only pertaining to this bill. Here, okay. Just so you know. Have you asked if they would be willing to change the timeline? Because I'm reading here, a lot of your opposition seems to be about the timeline. Uh, no, we have not had that conversation yet. Okay. Um, also, from your testimony and from what I'm reading in your testimony here, um, it seems like a lot of your opposition is pertaining to the fiscal note. Correct. Would that be right? Correct. Do you think that it's the role of departments to focus on the fiscal note, or is it the legislature's role? I think it's the legislature's the role to decide the policy. Um, but to make that informed with the fiscal impact of what it cost. Okay. Uh, Senator McKinney. Thank, thank you. you, Chair Rupi, and uh, thank you for your testimony. Do you think it's proper etiquette for departments to show up in opposition of senators' bills? I think it's important that when we are implementing the program, that the senators and the public be aware of the impact that that will have and the how if, if that was the case, wouldn't you have communicated with Senator Kavanaugh a lot sooner than you did if well, you thought that the senators and the public should consider the impact of a bill? This hearing process exists for a reason, um, and this bill is the same bill as the prior bill, and our testimony has not changed. If it exists for a reason, don't you think it would have been productive, possibly, over the interim to reach out to Senator Kavanaugh's office and work on a way to address the issues that you say were existed last year. So previously we worked very closely with Senator Crawford, um, but it was her office that drove that. I don't know what Senator senators are going to reintroduce in future sessions. Yeah, but you could have after the hearing last year said, Hey, Senator Kavanaugh, I don't know if you, I wasn't on the committee, so I don't know if you opposed last year, but I imagine you probably did. So after that hearing, reached out to her and say, hey, Senator Kavanaugh, although we opposed your bill, here are some ways that we possibly would come in neutral or in support to try to figure out a way to get this bill across the finish line. I think it's um, fair to say that both parties could have done that. But most importantly, you, since you're a department official, but thank you. So we're here to hear opinions, and uh, thank you very much. Appreciate that. Uh, are there other questions from the committee? Hearing none, thank you very much. Are there others who want to speak in opposition? You know the rules. Thank you, Chairman Reapy, members of the Business and Labor Committee. Uh, my name is Robert J. Hallstrom, H-A-L-L-S-T-R-O-M. I appear before you today as registered lobbyist for the National Federation of Independent Business in opposition to LB-57. Uh, LB-57 would significantly impact productivity in the operations of small businesses. Uh, the average size NFIB member has five employees. Uh, as a result, a single employee taking uh, family and medical leave under this bill uh, would require uh, or would operate without 20% of their total workforce over uh, more than 20% of the year. The alternative for small business owners under those conditions are to hire a temporary worker, uh, which is costly and generally ineffective. And as a result, employers will typically look to recover their cost by granting uh, fewer vacation days to employees or needing them to work mandatory overtime, which once again will significantly increase cost for employers. Uh, family and medical leave is not an essential benefit or even useful to many workers. Uh, time off issues are currently worked out in many small businesses every day without government intervention. Uh, the basic uh, premise is that the government mandate under LB57 would present an economic hardship for many small Nebraska employers, would require employers uh, to bear the cost of providing coverage for many employees who do not desire the benefit and would expand the mandate to cover a significant number of small Nebraska employers who are not presently subject to the federal law. Another cost aspect is the bill has provisions 
requiring employers to maintain an em absent employee's health care coverage, to hire a temporary replacement worker or pay others more when, work, when their work is redistributed, turn down business if that's re required because of a smaller staff, and incur employee turnover resulting from employees who choose not to return to the workforce after taking leave. Uh, business owners should be allowed to choose what combinations of wages, benefits, and leave plans work best for them and their employees, allowing individual businesses to address these issues is the best way to protect small businesses and their employees. Uh, with that, I'd be happy to address any questions that the committee may have. Thank you, sir. Senator McKinney. Thank you, and uh, thank you for your testimony. Um, I've you're in opposition. I guess I just have a question in the hypothetical, in a hypothetical thought, you know, since we have a lot, we have a strong push to ban abortions in the state of Nebraska, right? What if we have a baby boom and a lot of those families decide to, you know, stay home because they have to take care of those kids? What are the small businesses going to do? Well, Senator, obviously, I not going to venture out with a position on on abortion but i think what small business employers do on a regular basis is address the needs of their employees as best they can and if those situations come up uh, they are currently trying to accommodate the wishes and desires of the employees while at the same time having to operate their business and turn a profit how, how are they going to survive if a lot of those families have kids that have developmental disabilities and they, and they have to, and you heard earlier in the testimony, be home and go to different appointments and those type of things. How are those businesses going to survive if we ban abortions in the state of Nebraska and a lot of people have to t seek this option? What, what are businesses going to do if everybody just stays home? Well, if everybody stays home, they're going to have uh, difficulty hiring people. Uh, I'm not not sure that, that hypothetical is is going to rise to that level, but certainly it's, it's you've you've posed, you've posed the question. It's possible. Yeah. Thank you, Senator Blood. Thank you, Chairperson Breezy. I I don't have the bill in front of me, but did you read the bill? Yes. Wasn't there a part in the bill was, if it was created a burden, small businesses could opt out? Uh, Senator, my understanding was that if you had comparable benefits, that you could you could use that and opt out. So, have you spoken with Senator Kavanaugh prior to today? Uh, I have not spoken to her uh, on this bill. I've I've been here consistently opposing similar legislation in the past. Yeah, I remember you guys opposed things like minimum wage increase and. A lot of and we'll probably we be back this afternoon as well, Senator. Yeah, very familiar with your organization. Um, the benefits definitely people that are upper income and not usually working class, and that's I think what we're kind of talking about today. So, um, I think there's more room for to expand the opt out, and I'm really disappointed to hear that you're here again opposing it, not because you don't have the right to oppose it but because I know how hard the senators who bring these bills forward work on these bills and that they always seem to be open to negotiating and trying to make it better so it is easier for small business. So if I were a small business owner and you represented me, um, I would want to know that you're also negotiating to make things better for my employees. And Senator, I, I think we're, we're open to that. Obviously, one of the significant differences in this bill and federal law is that we have it applying to all small business owners while the federal law applies uh, only to those with 50 or more employees. So there is a significant uh, portion of that small business community that's covered under this bill that would not be if there was a, a an exemption for uh, similar to that under the federal law. So do I hear you saying that you may still work with Senator Kavanaugh? I, I'm always open to discussion and conversation, Senator. That's kind of what I do around here. Thank you. Are there other comments, questions from the committee? Hearing none, thank you very much. Thank you, Senator. Hi, this is not my first time. You're right, Chair, Mr. Chairman. 
Uh, members of the Business and Labor Committee, for the record, my name is Jennifer Krieger, J-E-N-N-I-F-E-R-C-R-E-A-G-E-R. -E -E I'm the Senior Vice President of the Greater Omaha Chamber. I'm also appearing today on behalf of the Lincoln Chamber of Commerce. Um, Senator Ka or excuse me, yes, Senator Kavanaugh mentioned in her opening that she and I have met on the bill and discussed it. Um, she has seen my testimony before I came today. I'm going to share with you what I shared with her. Um, we are opposed today because our, we have a historical position opposed to the bill. However, both the Lincoln Chamber and the Omaha Chamber um, have indicated that if some changes are considered, um, we are willing to negotiate those and could consider changing our position. Uh, first, I want to emphasize that this is an issue that we have been committed to trying to get to consensus on. Employee compensation and benefits are employee, important elements of business and workforce development now more than ever before. To that extent, and in response to numerous legislative proposals, the Omaha Chamber convened a paid family leave working group comprised of business representatives who are well-versed in the operations of employer operations and employee benefits to further explore state paid family leave programs. In addition to conducting in-depth research, we consulted with people from communities uh, such as the Boston Chamber and the Colorado Chamber to discuss their experiences with similar programs. Our guiding principles for our working group were availability of talent is the greatest area of need for our members. Offering some package of employee benefits, including dedicated paid family leave, is an important way to attract talent. We want to be a community that is known as a great place to work and live. Many of our largest employers already offer these benefits. A comprehensive federal solution is preferable to a patchwork of different state regulations for our members who do business in multiple states. Employers who offer paid family leave programs as a benefit of employment should be exempt from government requirements as long as the benefits they offer meet a threshold of qualification. Any future programs should mirror the requirements of the Family Medical Leave Act to the greatest extent possible. Smaller sized businesses, fewer than 50, will have the greatest difficulties complying with a mandated program and consideration should be given to an exemption or different, different requirements. Our biggest concern remains the effect on small businesses. Even small businesses who express support of mandatory paid family leave as a policy matter have raised concerns about the implication to their operations, both in, both in terms of cost and staffing. At this time, we believe an exemption for fewer than 50 employees consistent with FMLA is necessary. Please note that a substantial portion of the Omaha Chamber's membership is comprised of small business. We're also concerned about cost burden Requiring employers to cover the full cost of the program would result in Nebraska joining the District of Columbia as one of the few jurisdictions requiring businesses to cover the full cost. Particularly for low profit margin businesses, this would reduce funding that could go to compensation or other benefits for employees for a program they might not never utilize. Another consideration is flexibility. A mandatory program with specific requirements would hinder efforts by employers to tailor employee benefit programs to the needs and preferences of their employees. Uniform cost and benefit requirements come with the assumption that all businesses and institutions are like, alike. Finally, we're interested in the opt-out provisions. Though Senator Kavanaugh's proposal does provide for an opt-out for employers that offer paid leave that meets at least the minimum requirements of LV, LV 57, this would come with a regulatory verification burden for both the employer and the state, and it could rule out benefit plans, for example, private disability insurance that would otherwise be considered generous, tailored to unique needs of the business employees and favored by those employees. We have been supportive of incentive-based programs such as tax credits, which encourage further employee creation and usage of expanded leave benefits. As I mentioned, we are opposed today, but have communicated with Senator Kavanaugh and look forward to discussing uh, amendments to LB 57. You have one minute. I'm done. Thank oh, you. Good. Good <laughs> Thank you for being here. Other questions from the committee? <laughs> Seeing that. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Uh, more opponents? Thank you. Thank you, Chairman Reapy and members of the committee. My name is Ansley Fellers, A-N-S-L-E-Y-F-E-L-L-E-R-S. -E -E I'm here on behalf of the Nebraska Grocery Industry Association, the Nebraska State Chamber, Nebraska Retail Federation, Nebraska Hospitality Association, and the Nebraska Petroleum Marketers and Convenience Store Association, testifying in opposition to LB 57. Now that my five minutes is up, oh, no, just kidding. 
Um, first and foremost, our organizations believe employers should be allowed to choose what combination of wages and benefits work for their business and their employees. Employers or organiz organizations represent appreciate the difficulty individuals face in balancing family and work obligations. But LB 57, like the last testifier said, represents a sweeping mandate with high costs. And instead of limiting the mandate to employers subject to FMLA, the Family Medical Leave Act, LB 57 will impact nearly all businesses across the state, regardless of size or ability to comply. Additionally, LB 57 imposes the entirety of the cost of the new paid leave pool on employers. Imposing 100% of the cost of this program on employers is not how most other states have approached this issue. I'd like to note I'm executive director of the Nebraska Grocery Industry Association, and in the last two weeks, I feel the number of calls about the increasing price of eggs. Over the last year, as all of you know, it hasn't just been eggs. The cost of food and other staples is going up, and yet here we are again testifying in opposition to high cost mandates. Grocers, and you'll hear from one this afternoon, operate on a 1% to 2% margin. In normal years, when we see modest amounts of inflation, they eat certain increasing costs because of the plethora of competition in the industry. When inflation is at record highs, though, these costs are passed on. This is happening in every industry. The cost of goods and services is going up, and I would ask that on a fundamental level, the legislature not add fuel to the inflationary fire by driving up the cost of doing business. Since 2021, the federal government has been providing employers a tax credit for employees providing pay, for employers providing paid family and medical leave as a result of the pandemic. While our organizations truly believe that employers are best situated to determine what combination of wages and benefits work best for their businesses and their employees, the carrot represented by a tax credit is much preferred to the stick represented by LB57. Thank you for your time. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you for your presentation. I see uh, Senator McKinney. Thank you, Chair Reepy. Thank you for your testimony. How are the grocers going to, going to survive if our population continues to get older and our kids just say, I'm leaving because the state of Nebraska doesn't offer anything that makes us want to stay? Well, I grew up in western Nebraska and I moved away and come back and came back. So I would, I think that there are things our state offers that people enjoy and want to come back for, I'm 100% open to, and I think the people I represent are open to discussing economic development and ways of bringing people back and keeping people in small towns. Um, like I said, I have a, a grocer from a small town in Nebraska testifying this afternoon, and he can tell you exactly what he provides to his employees, the flexibility that people enjoy with small employers, um, not just in terms of time off, but um, working and providing additional hours to people who might need it, um, employing young people in various positions. And I think that these folks who live in these communities are really invested. He's a third generation guy. Um, they don't want to lose their communities. They want to keep their kids there, their own kids even. And so I think we should give them the benefit of the doubt. Yeah, but a lot of young professionals are when they're looking to either stay or leave or even come to Nebraska, this is something high on that priority list of, does this state have these type of things that will make me feel comfortable starting a family or raising a family in a state? And I just don't see how we can say we want people to stay in Nebraska, grow in Nebraska, recruit people in Nebraska, but we put things on the table that would help do that and a huge portion of the state, I won't, maybe not a huge portion, but a portion of the state is always saying no to things that would keep young people here. And my fear is that we'll continue to say no to things like this and 10, 20 years down the line, we'll say our population is super old and all our kids are on the coast. Yeah, I can appreciate that. I do think to at least some extent, if we wanna keep kids in our small towns, we need to keep some of our main streets alive. And at some point it's, true that the larger the industry is and the larger the business is, the easier it is for them to comply with some of these mandates. So if we want to keep some of these kind of fun and good and small town jobs, it's it's not going to do a lot of good to bring kids back if there aren't the jobs for them and that these businesses don't exist or gonna, they can't start a business. But if I'm going to work for a small employer, I'm that's still something I'm going to hope they, they offer. So I think they, I, I, I'm sorry. just... Yes, it's something to think about. Thank Absolutely, you. and we yeah, and I hope I hope that the committee will consider the the tax credit option. All right, thank, thank you. you. Thank you, sir. Are there other questions? Seeing none. Thank you for being here.
uh, opponents? Are there additional opponents? Anyone speaking in opposition? If not, are there people here to testify in terms of the neutral position? Okay, seeing none, uh, I see that we have 18 letters of proponents, two in opposition, and zero neutral for the record. Senator, you're welcome to close. Thank you, Chairman Reedby and members of the committee. Thank you for your attention to this, especially over the lunch hour. Um, so I want to start with some of the opposition uh, timeline is clearly an opposition. That is something that is the easiest thing to fix is the timeline for implementation. And I'm always willing to work with the departments on the timeline. Um, also, with, when it comes to the employer size and opt-in opt in or opt-out, those are conversations that I'm more than happy to have. Uh, as Ms. Krieger mentioned, we have spoken about this and we are going to work together and most likely bring an amendment that is a negotiated amendment with the, at least the Omaha Chamber. Um, I do wanna to speak to uh, the testimony from the Department of Labor about the cost. This is something that I have seen over the last four years is that especially in the Department of Health and Human Services and the HHS committee, having state agencies come in opposition to bills and their only reason is the cost. It is our responsibility as state legislators to manage the budget. We decide, that's our job, it's our constitutional responsibility, the budget. It is our job to decide what is worthy of taxpayer dollars and what is not. That is our job. It is state agencies' jobs to implement the policies and to use their judgment for promulgating rules and regulations. It is not their job to come in opposition to any legislation about the cost. How this is paid for, if this is paid for, if this passes and we pay for it, is entirely incumbent upon us. Now, to the other questions about cost. Yes, this is 100% employer paid, and here's why. The wonderful former Senator Sue Crawford worked on this issue for her entire eight years in the legislature, and she negotiated every possible version you can think of. Employer paid, employee paid, matching, state paid. You think of it, she did it. And every time there was opposition, it did not matter. It did not matter how it was paid for. So I thought, what is the Cadillac version of paid family medical leave? And let's start there and work our way from there. So that's what I introduced last year, um, or I think it was two years ago. And I will say that the conversations around the bill at that time were disappointing. Nobody was interested in engaging with me. The department wouldn't engage with me. The state chamber certainly did not engage with me. And nobody was interested in having a negotiation or a conversation about what this could look like in reality that works best for the employers, the employees, and the state. I am, whether you believe it or not, happy by today's opposition testimony. It was much more in the vein of, let's see what we can do together, even though it was still some hard opposition. So I do want to work on this. This is this and developmental disabilities are the two reasons that I ran for the legislature. That's it. You honestly could have gotten rid of me at the end of last year if we had done this last year. This is it. This is my passion. I want to make sure that our workforce is taken care of, that our families are taken care of. Nebraska should be the best place to live, raise a family, and retire. But we're not going to be if our workforce is in jeopardy of losing their job, if our small employers are in jeopardy of losing their employees. This is a public good. And like all public goods, it's not going to be a benefit to everyone, but it is going to be a benefit to the greater good of our state and to our workforce development. Um, one of our testifiers talked about roads. And when we're recruiting people to come to this state, we talk so much about our infrastructure, our roads, broadband. I personally would not have moved back to the state if it weren't for my parents. I couldn't have children. I couldn't do this job. I like, couldn't do it without my husband, of course, but also I couldn't do it without my parents. If I didn't have my parents as a backup for my, my poor, wonderful saint of a husband, 
I could not do the job that I'm doing right now. And I couldn't have done any of the other jobs that I've done as an adult with children. It would have been impossible. And that we want people to move here to make this their new home, not their come back to their home. We're not going to get new people here unless their parents are going to retire and move with them, which is not a reality. So um, I am committed to working on this with the committee. I'm committed to working on this with everyone in opposition. I think that this is an extraordinarily important issue. And um, I think those of you, I think we only have one person who's new to the body on this committee. No, two, sorry. Um, but you will come to quickly realize that I am, I think Senator Pansing Brooks once called me aggressively tenacious. So I'll leave it with that and answer any questions you have. Are there any questions from the committee members? Your Thank you, Chairman Reepy. I think uh, you made a comment that uh, the budget's our responsibility. It is. Right. Uh, but paying for this is not our responsibility. Not necessarily, no. No, it's the business's responsibility. Well, that's how my bill is written, yes. Right. So there's a distinction there between this being a legislature's responsibility as a budget versus a mandate on businesses. Well, I was speaking to the opposition of the Department of Labor because their upfront costs would come from our, our, our funds. Can I ask you a quick question? Yes. On the fiscal note, which yep. you're a big fan of. I am a big fan of this. Um, the revenue for 24, and there's probably a simple answer for this and I should know it, and I'm overlooking it, but for 24, 25, the revenue is uh, Five hundred and forty-three million dollars versus expenditures. I know. I think that's odd. It's it shouldn't be. Have you asked them about that? Well, you know how fiscal notes are right now. We get them like. Have you have you asked? No, them? no, because I did. I just received the fiscal note. I think within over the weekend. So. So it's like two point seven times the. Yes. What they say the expenditures. If there's something in the bill that creates it doing that or they perceive it that way, that would be something I would amend. It's it should be revenue neutral. So you're gonna visit with them on that? Of course, yes. Okay. Thank, you. Thank you very much. Um, are there any other questions? Hearing none. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so Thank much you for, for your, your time. Uh, with that uh, I conclude that we've been fair in the afternoon session. Yeah. I got Open, uh, hearing. Hearing. <laughs> so, so we're closed on LB fifty seven. We're going to take a lunch time and we're going to reconvene here at 2.15. We will start out with the uh, confirmation hearing for uh, the Commissioner for the Labor oh, Department, uh, Mr. John Albright. Thank you all. See you this afternoon at 2.15. Bring my coat down, put it on my lap. You get the microphone. I have a question. I have a question. And I'm sure it's going to be hard. I'm sure so first of all, that's previous, and that's nothing that's going to change. So this is from previous legislation. Previous legislation, and yeah, that's to help their cash flow. Their cash flow gets stuck. They get deposits all the time. So.